Listen to The Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. There's something about mm-hmm. the feel of the pen in your hand. Hello, Tess. How are you doing? Love the giant glasses. <laughs> your microphone's muted. Todd takes it. He does his magic and it comes out beautiful every time. There I am. The paranormal could be a creative expression of the universe. Well, that was not me. I don't know who that guy was. (laughs) It might be something you collect as a stamp as a kid or a sticker. That lady on the right there, I could Mm -hmm. not deal with that mask. It's been a little synchronicity machine of an episode here. Ed, roll those closing credits. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Wondrium, Squarespace, Simply Safe, Mint Mobile, Roman, Wondery, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. We asked you to send in your scariest personal stories just a few weeks ago. Over 130 have come in so far, and more are arriving daily. Many of you wrote that you'd never shared them before, and if you had, it was only to a small handful of people. Think about all the paranormal stories out there in the world. You've probably heard a lot of them on our show and others. Then think about all the stories that have never been told. Tonight's legend was nearly one of those. In September 1964, a 26-year-old man named Donald Shrum went hunting with two friends in Cisco Grove, California. After spreading out to look for game, he separated from his friends and couldn't find his way back to their camp. Shrum was an experienced hunter, and as darkness began to fall, he realized that wandering around in the isolated and rugged terrain was not a good idea. Knowing that apex predators could be a threat to a man sleeping out in the open in this part of the country, he did what many hunters would do in the same scenario and decided to climb up a tree to spend the night. This would offer a modicum of protection from those predators. As he was trying to settle in for the night in the tree, He saw a search helicopter in the distance, so he signaled it for help. To his relief, it headed in his direction, but it wasn't a helicopter. It was something else, and it wasn't friendly. For the next 12 hours, Shrum was locked in a private war with beings seemingly focused on kidnapping him. He and his family kept his story quiet for decades. In fact, when he did try to find explanations for it, he wouldn't allow his name to be mentioned for over 40 years. So tonight, we'll share a legend that was nearly never made public at all, the battle at Cisco Grove. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. I won. They didn't take me. Donald Trump and Noe Torres and Ruben Uriate, authors of Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. Join us tonight as we look into one of the most bizarre UFO cases we've covered, the battle at Cisco Grove. And we're back. That we are, folks. If you're a patron, we hope you enjoyed our recent Junk Drawer episode with Rob Christofferson and illustrator and artist Todd Purse, where they came on and talked about their new webcomic, which is excellent. Welcome, UFO people. It is super (laughs) excellent and super awesome and a lot of fun. And we had a great talk with them. And we know a lot of our listeners are artists and illustrators and people who take a lot of time doing what they do to craft it, and they they want something in their earballs, and it's us. But if you're into artwork, and especially web comics and UFOs and all that good stuff, definitely head on over to Patreon.com/slash/AstonishingLegends to access the junk drawer shows, which, by the way, are usually presented live on video. Okay, so we got a great show tonight. Let's get into it, right? Yeah, because sometimes we have a terrible show in store for you. But this one's good. I I know. I I took that from (laughs) Letterman and all those guys. They always would just be like, we got a great show tonight. And it's like, do we really? I think so. Listen, come on. Everything that we do, we think, is really interesting. We want to know more about it. We think you think like us, and you would like to know more about it as well. Our apologies if you don't. But here's this case, which is... I thought fascinating on several levels because there are several ways to look at it and it runs the gamut of that radio dial spectrum of utterly terrifying 
to being comically strange in some spots. Yes. But it gets under your skin in a way. And it's it's one of those instances where I wish I could have been a fly on the wall or a bird in a tree looking at all this unfold. On the other hand, I think I also would have been terrified. Well, I want to convey that because... That's one of the things is when you're when you're reading the story, when you're reading this, uh, and it, it appears in a lot of different places. But one of the books we relied on for this story tonight is actually called Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. Mm-hmm. And that's written by Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte. It's the actual tale. It says in it, as told by Donald R. Shrum. That's the experiencer who you're going to be hearing about from his point of view. There's also these amazing illustrations in the book by Neil yeah. Ribe that are really great to look at. They help add depth to the story and drawings by Shrum himself of what he saw and what he encountered, which you're going to be hearing about here in a minute. Anyway, that was published in 2011 by a book label you probably already heard of called RoswellBooks.com. So you can get that on Kindle off of Amazon, or you can also purchase a uh, paperback version of it. And we'll have a link to it in the show notes. So we recommend it as the best way to take the story in if you want to know more after you hear tonight's show. Well, it's the best source, I think, and best resource because they went to the source. Ruben Uriarte actually spent a few days, maybe about up to a week, with the Shrums. And they trusted him enough to give him everything because at this point, and we may elucidate this a little further, he hadn't told a story for decades because of all the obvious reasons. But once they met Ruben, they really trusted him as well as Noy to tell the story. And they thought that this story should be told uh, because they're getting up in age and his health wasn't great at this point, but they trusted him to give him everything. And that is uh, the sketches, the original reports, their testimony as best that they could remember it, and it was everything. So I think if you want to know more about this, this is the be-all, end-all of the source on this. Yeah, it's the best place to start. Now, there were initial reports taken by investigators like Paul Cerny, and those were perhaps fresher from the time, but I think it's also taken decades for this to really gel. I don't think he's forgotten anything. I think another interesting aspect of this incident was that he was fully conscious for most of it, as we'll see, but it wasn't like it all had to be retrieved with hypnosis, regression therapy hypnosis. He was there for most of it and could uh, retell it, and I don't think he ever forgot it for the rest of his life. Well, on that note, before we start to analyze the story, we want to share it with you in as much detail as we can. So we're going to start out with that tonight. You're going to hear exactly what happened to Donald Trump. And again, we're very lucky to have this version of the story straight from him because he's no longer with us. So it's great that this was captured by these guys and shared with the world. And it's taken from uh, transcripts of interviews he did at the time, but also they went back and got additional information from his family and from other witnesses that they were capable of. And some of those witnesses have passed away too. All right. So the following here will be the main elements of Donald Trump's account. In September of 1964, Donald Shrum, a welder and painter for the Aerojet General Corporation, went on a bow hunting trip with some friends a little over an hour northeast of Sacramento, where he lived and worked. This time of year, it was illegal to hunt with a firearm, but Shrum didn't mind because he was a better shot with a bow and arrow anyway. Shrum was born in Arkansas, but when this happened, he had been working outside of Sacramento on rockets, surface-to-air missiles, and more. On this particular Friday, Shrum and his two friends, Vincent Alvarez and Tim Trueblood, left Sacramento for Cisco Grove, California, about three quarters of the way to Lake Tahoe. Vincent Alvarez and Shrum were pretty close as friends. Trueblood worked an alternating shift from Shrum and was more acquainted with Vincent than Don. But Tim and Don were both missile painters at Aerojet at this time, where all three worked. Everyone was in a good mood and excited about the weekend. They didn't have any means of electronic communication, so when they set out to go hunting, they stayed close enough to call out to each other. But at some point, Shrum, who we'll call Don from this point forward, found himself up on a ridge with them down below. His buddies told him to walk around and come down, but it was further than they all expected, and at some point, Shrum got a little too far away from them and became a bit disoriented. From his story, it didn't really seem like a life and death situation. Not at that point anyway. But as it began to get dark, he realized that he was unlikely to find his way back to camp, which was only one or two miles away as the crow flies, but it was still over two or three peaks and the area was very rugged. 
he would need to take shelter and at least ride the night out. As an experienced hunter, he knew his friends would come looking for him at some point, or maybe tomorrow he could make it back to the campsite. But for now, there were concerns over mountain lions, bears, coyotes, and possibly even cougars. He would need to find shelter to safely get some sleep, so he did what many hunters might have done in the same scenario. He found a suitable tree to climb. It wasn't a super large tree, but it would do. The first branch was a good 12 feet off the ground, but because it grew out of the cliffside rocks, he could use them to cheat his way up into it. The higher he got, the flimsier it became, but if anything started after him, he might have a chance at defending himself until morning. Sunset was at 7.31 p.m. that night. It would be dark by 8.30. It was darker still because the moon actually set 22 minutes before the sun, and it wouldn't rise until almost 6 a.m. the next morning. It would be very dark that night. Or would it? Somewhere between 9 and 9.30 p.m. that night, Don saw light in the sky to the north, and it was below the horizon. It seemed to be moving up and down like a flashlight, but it went up above the tree line at one point. Vincent and Tim must have gotten word to the Forest Service, and they had sent a helicopter out to look for him. It was a comforting feeling. Don knew, especially on this dark night, that he would have to signal the helicopter so they could find him. He always carried plenty of matches, so he climbed out of the evergreen he was perched in and lit some signal fires on top of three large rocks close by. Three fires would signal that they were man-made and would be easier to see from a distance. According to the book, they were about 10 feet apart. Thinking the pilots might not see the fires, he began waving and yelling in the direction of the light. Finally, he caught its attention and it moved toward him. Only something was wrong. It was coming way too fast. And on top of that, it was not making any sound. In fact, it was dead silent. How could... This doesn't make any sense. It had a light on the front that was bright. A landing light or headlight or something. But it was smaller than it should be. But there was something else about the aircraft. It was black. Blacker than black. Almost as if it absorbed light. He couldn't really tell its full dimensions just yet. There was just this small point of light at the front. Seeing it there, hovering silently, Don knew something wasn't right. He began to get scared. He knew what modern science was capable of. After all, he worked at Aerojet in Rancho Cordova, just east of Sacramento. He welded and painted missiles, including the nuclear-armed submarine-launched UGM-27 Polaris missile. It could be launched from underwater. It was the pinnacle of aeronautic development at the time, and Don and both of his friends all worked on building them. He knew what humanity was capable of at that moment, and on that night, whatever he was looking at was clearly not built by humanity. It was fast, silent, and now curious about either him or the signal fires he had set. The tree. He had to get back to the tree. It was the only cover he had. Maybe if he got back into it, whatever was piloting this thing would forget about him and go back to whatever it was initially doing in the dark valley of the canyon below him. He returned to the tree, threw his bow into it, and started climbing. It wasn't much of a defense, but better than nothing. He had no idea what he was dealing with. He was wearing camo from head to toe, so he climbed up and froze. It was very dark inside the tree branches. He thought maybe he would go unnoticed. He didn't appear to be sure if it had seen him yet. Then the craft looped around and got much closer to Don. At that moment, it turned a bit to an angle, and Don noticed what he would describe as three windows on its side. Only they weren't aligned in the way you would expect. They were staggered, almost checkerboarded, but not touching. At this moment, Don realized that the distance from the small light he had first seen to the first of the three windows was about 50 feet, which meant the whole craft was up to 150 feet long. Equivalent, as the authors of Aliens in the Forest point out, to a 14-story building on its side. The windows weren't windows as we would know them. They shimmered like aluminum foil, according to Shrum. He 
couldn't clearly make out the overall shape of the craft, but to him it appeared that the stars in the sky were being blocked by something oval. The ship moved with a speed that could be described as defying the laws of physics. It would cover great distances silently and instantaneously. The laws of fluid dynamics seemed to have no effect on its travel. For the moment, it seemed that Don was safe in the tree, until a small craft emerged from the middle of the three windows. A smaller craft he referred to as a module. Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte refer to the two ships as a mothership and a scout ship in their book, Aliens in the Forest. This smaller craft had what one might describe as a very typical feature of a small dome with a flashing light on top. He lost track of it after it shot out of the larger craft into the darkness, but eventually it settled up on a hill a little distance away from him. Torres and Iriarte point out that the concept of a mothership and a lander was not in the public zeitgeist and wouldn't be until three years later with the first Apollo mission. The smaller craft seemed to be in the distance, about a half mile away, and it seemed to have settled down in some bushes. Then Don could clearly hear the sound of something, or several somethings, crashing through the dense brush towards him in the darkness. This went on for what seemed like five or ten minutes, just getting closer and closer to him. The fear within him must have skyrocketed. Torres and Iriarte estimate the windows on the mothership's side as up to 600 square feet in size. This would define the size of the scout ship, or module as Don called it, probably large enough to carry several beings. That was if they were humanoid. And they were. One finally emerged from the brush. It was short, stocky, and wore a uniform or suit. Their faces were just black voids, but there was one thing he could make out. Large, dark, round eyes. It almost looked like they were wearing welder's goggles. Their suits or uniforms were silver or white in color, as best he could tell. Even though they seemed to be headed this way, they also seemed easily distracted by their surroundings and curious as they stopped to study flora and fauna along the way. But then the two beings continued towards him. A hot panic set in. It was now confirmed that whatever was going on here, it was unearthly. Don had been hunting for 10 years. He knew his way in the wild and how to protect himself. Well, against wild animals anyway. But remember, he has no firearms. He has nothing but a bow and a few arrows. And on top of that, he's trapped in a tree. How can he defend himself? Maybe it's a coincidence that they were headed towards him. But it soon became clear it wasn't. The two of them came directly to the base of the tree he was in and just calmly stared up at him. The large dark eyes or welder's goggles paralyzed him with fear. He knew now that they knew he was there. At worse, there was nowhere for him to go. He could not discern any features on their faces beyond their eyes except possibly a nose of some kind that was lower and flatter than it should have been. That was when he heard them communicating. He said it was almost like doves cooing or owls hooting. It was easy for him to tell that they were somehow receiving messages, likely from that mother ship, because when the sounds would happen, they would take new action. Thankfully, they turned their attention back to the world around them, as if they were looking for something. More of them turned up too, there were now apparently about a half a dozen. Was this all it would be? These things were collecting samples and maybe just leaving. But he then heard a new visitor approaching. Something larger, with bright red eyes like flashlights. He called it the robot. It was coming from an entirely different direction, avoiding the dense brush that the first group had come through. He could only see the detail of the head and neck, but overall it was metallic in appearance. Its face was different. Don said it had some kind of large mouth and a hinged jaw. It moved with greater difficulty, more mechanically. Once it drew near to him, it just stopped and stood under the tree, motionless, like a cadaver dog waiting for its master's approval. Don's signal fires were nearly out just glowing embers at this point. The robot didn't seem to care for them, so it went over and scattered the ashes with its arm. In the light of the embers, he could clearly see the robot's hand, which he later described as looking like a medieval metal gauntlet. 
The robot then came over to Don's tree, stood under it, slowly raised its hand to its mouth, and did something that caused a white vapor to come out and rise up through the tree to Don, 12 feet above the robot. The vapor had no smell, but whatever it was, it knocked Don out cold. He slumped over unconscious, but thankfully did not fall to the ground. Don would wake up what he took to be a few moments later, dry heaving from whatever had knocked him out. He would gather his wits, and the robot would come over and do it again, over and over. He considered this an escalation and decided to be proactive about his defense. He may not have had a gun or rifle, but he did have his bow. A 60-pound bow at that, and according to Torres in Uriate's book, an arrow shot at close range flies at nearly the same velocity as a bullet from a rifle. He decided it was time to take measures, though, and he felt he needed to pick a target. As scared as he was, morally and ethically, he thought the smaller, more humanoid beings were not threatening him. It was all about this gas-emitting robot that kept knocking him out. He would take a shot at it, and his arrow found its mark right in the center of the robot's chest. It pushed the robot back a few feet, but bounced off its chest and, according to Don, created a bright flash of light similar to an arc welder. After that, the robot retreated 10 to 20 feet. He wound up firing all three of the ones he had. The same thing happened each time. The robot always returned. The smaller humanoids retreated as well. Would they return fire? He had no idea. But fortunately for him, they did not. He remembered the robot brushing the embers from his signal fire away and thought he could use the many matches he had with him, which he always carried, to maybe start a small fire or scare it. So at first, he lit a book of matches and threw it down. The robot backed up. He lit his hat on fire and threw it down. It backed up over 50 feet. But whenever these small fires went out, it would return. It was relentless. There was not enough brush near him to start a localized larger fire, so he kept ripping pieces of clothing and whatever else he could, setting them alight and throwing them down. He burned his hunting license, cash, and wallet, all of it. Ultimately, he had nothing left but a t-shirt, Levi's, and shoes. Once he was out of things to light, he realized that he had likely made his last stand. Even though the tree was not all that large, he was 12 feet up already, and he thought, well, it might hold me a little higher, so I'll go higher. Then he took his belt and strapped himself around the trunk so he wouldn't fall out. The robot returned and kept trying to knock Don out with a vapor, and it worked. But he never felt he was unconscious very long. He would wake up, and it would seem only a few minutes had passed, but now the smaller, more humanoid beings could be seen trying to climb the tree. Whenever they noticed he was awake, they would back down. Don had used a neighboring rock to climb the lowest branch at 12 feet, but these things couldn't figure that out. Instead, one was trying to help the other up. Don was running out of options. He started throwing coins down at them. They would step away, and the robot would return and knock him out again. He was violently shaking the tree now that he was up at the top. He started to do the math on how long he was unconscious each time by always waking up and catching the humanoids trying to climb again, but they hadn't made it very far. Getting down to his last item, he even threw his canteen at them at one point, and one of them went to pick it up, looked at it, and then just threw it down. Apparently, it didn't interest them. Don even imitated coyotes he could hear in the distance, trying to convince these things, whatever they were, that reinforcements were inbound. They were completely unfazed. The darkness of night was over 11 hours long in the evening between September 4th and 5th, 1964. Don was exhausted. He'd fired arrows, thrown things, shaken the tree, been gassed unconscious over and over, and hadn't gotten any sleep. He was exhausted, and at one point, even contemplated throwing himself off the cliff that the tree grew partially over. But in that moment, he remembered his wife and young daughter whom he loved very much and thought better of it. Although it was still dark, 
Faint hints of dawn were creeping in and Don wondered how much longer this assault could go. The temperature had descended to just above freezing. He had burned most of his clothes and he was running out of options. Now he observed not one but two of the robots at the base of his tree. They stood across from each other and something amazing happened. Bright arcs of white light flashed between them, almost like information being shared. It looked like electrified plasma. What were they doing? Apparently combining power to release a lot more of the knockout gas than had been used before. It drifted up through the tree, and this time it was cold, very cold, and more effective. It knocked on out completely for a long time. He woke up some time later. The belt he had strapped himself to the tree with had apparently kept him from falling out of it when he was passed out. The sun was finally rising and most importantly, he was alone. You know what's one of the first things I do when we've decided on a new episode topic? I know what you do. You search for connections to a Wonderium course because that's the same thing I do. <laughs> you betcha. But I didn't have to search this time because right there on the Wonderium landing page on the new releases slider bar is the series Secrets, Secrets of, of the, the Occult. Occult. You know what? I saw that and it's on my list, but yeah. I first want to get through the fantastic series. What can the James Webb Telescope see? Oh, yeah. That's super fascinating to me. You got to tell me this, though. What connection did you find between UFOs and the occult? I found it's all connected. Professor Richard B. Spence, who we've mentioned before, lays out a compelling case. Like 1947, 1952 was a watershed year. Instead of using technology, George Hunt Williamson uses a Ouija board to try and contact ETs, and Williamson would later try channeling or mediumship. Williamson was one of the four Georges in the Golden Age of Flying Saucers, along with George Adamski, George King, and George Van Tassel. Besides UFOs, they were all immersed in occult beliefs and practices. 1946, a follower of Aleister Crowley, Rocketman Jack Parsons, tries to conjure the goddess Babylon. Some believe Parsons may have opened a portal for UFOs and the demonic entities controlling them out to consume human soul energy. That was the belief in 1952 of a shadowy group of U.S. military and intelligence officials called the Collins Elite. That same year, Parsons dies in a mysterious explosion and Washington, D.C. is swarmed by UFOs. From supernatural acting men in black to the research of Alan Greenfield and his secret cipher of the UFO knots, there is no doubt the UFO phenomenon and the occult have always been connected. And now I sound like Fox Mulder after too much coffee. Uh, just one question. Is Sigourney yeah. Weaver playing the goddess Babylon like in Ghostbusters? Ooh, nice reference. Maybe so, maybe not. Bad dad mm. joke. I, I don't mm. know. We know Mulder would have loved Wondrium, and we know you're going to love it as much as we all do. So what are you waiting for? Sign up today. Need an incentive? Well, Wondrium is offering our listeners 50% off your first three months. That's half off when you sign up for your first quarterly plan. That's a fantastic deal. But to get this offer, you need to visit our special URL, wondrium.com slash legends. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash legends. We were pretty happy about how the last three episodes of Listener Stories came out, but I don't think some in the audience realized how much time and effort that was to pull it off. Uh, yeah. I mean, there were a ton of stories to read and organize, and then once those were sorted, it was no small feat to coordinate everyone's schedule across the country and even internationally to get them recorded when we were also available <laughs> and then get all the post-production going. Oh, yeah. Well, it was no ale clip show to be sure. But, you know, we did forget something. A very handy tool that was at our disposal that would have really helped us out with scheduling that we totally forgot we could use. And we've even mentioned it on the show before. Yeah, that was a real forehead slapper. We could have scheduled everything through our Squarespace website. Yep. Squarespace has just about every online tool you'd need to get whatever you got going on done with efficiency and Boku style. You don't need to coordinate a bunch of people's calendars with yours because when you add online booking and scheduling to your Squarespace website, like if you teach classes or provide sessions or services, 
your clients can see your availability and they can book their own reservations, appointments, or classes. Or if they have to reschedule, they can do it themselves. So you're not playing email tag with anyone like we were this last time because we forgot to use this. Yeah, lesson <laughs> learned. Well, well, look, we were so jammed up. We forgot Squarespace is all about freeing up your time and making you look good doing it. Like with their simultaneous posting, Squarespace can authenticate your social profiles, letting you auto post your content to Twitter, Facebook, and that's personal or brand page, or Tumblr. All post entries and images are optimized and tagged properly so descriptions and titles will be correctly referenced. Then, going the other way, display posts from your social profiles on your website. That is efficient synergy, baby. It's time you let Squarespace do more of the heavy lifting for you so you can get back to creating and earning. Don't waste another minute with us bozos. Head on over to squarespace.com legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash legends. G'day, this is Paul from Perth in Western Australia. And when I'm not washing my undies after listening to the Sully House tapes, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Okay, so at this point, there's some question, even in his mind, about whether or not he truly was in the tree all night. Yeah. He wondered about that for a while because it seemed that way. He woke up and he was alone and he was still strapped in right. the way he remembered being strapped in. But you know, you've heard on our own show stories of people being removed and put back in bed in cars wherever <laughs> without their control. But it seemed like these particular aliens or whatever they were weren't capable of the levitation <laughs> and aportation and all that kind of stuff or they wouldn't have had such a hard time at the bottom of the tree. Yes. I mean, th those are obvious things. If you take the testimony and having gone through all this and reading about what other investigators have thought about Mr. Shrum and his story is that they're fully on board with this being an honest and authentic account. And there are, of course, corroborating elements to it, not only from the Air Force as having received the story, but a well-respected retired astronomer and you also have several people who went to the site afterwards. They're not sure, one or two weeks later after this happened and saw evidence that something there did indeed happen, most likely as Donald said, but also was covered up. And so there was that yeah. was pretty obvious, but yeah. it's, you know, several people now have seen evidence that at least the Air Force took it seriously. But as far as Donald Trump himself knew, he wasn't interested in UFOs at all before this. It was just nothing that popped up on his radar. Didn't really care about it. He certainly did afterwards. So he probably didn't know anything about missing time and being teleported uh, through matter as uh, some other experiencers will have testified to later on. He just knew that he was perhaps not conscious for some of it. And there was a spell there where it could have been very likely that he was moved and he just didn't know and he wouldn't yeah. know or he wouldn't have an anchor or spot or flagpole of belief until decades later. Let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about Donald Trump, who he was and what this situation was. He was a fairly young guy. He was only 26 years old at the time. He was happily married. He and his wife had a one-year-old little girl named Donna. And at the time he was working at a company in Rancho Cordova called Aerojet. Uh, this was a little bit east of Sacramento. And I'm doing an old school callback to classic AL. I want to take us on a little bit of a tangent here. All Ooh, right. Wait, wait, this, what, you talk about the, your weekend plans? No, no, no. It's not going to be that far off base. We okay. did used to do that sort of thing. <laughs> well, no, it, look, it's related to this. today. This is going to no, be related to the story. This, will, this, this is, is related to the yeah. story. And it's also related to probably the Wondrium spot that you just heard. And here's what's weird about uh. that. Forrest wrote up the outline for that spot, the initial outline for that commercial, independently of me making this discovery about Aerojet. And then we got together to record the show, and I said, hey, man, I found this crazy connection. <laughs> and he was like, wait a minute. I wrote that into the Wondrium commercial. Yeah. So that was a sheer coincidence. We were working separately, and that was a coincidence. Well, the real coincidence would be me stumbling upon this new series. It's, it was on the new series banner. And it's like, oh, yeah, I, I know this professor. He's really cool. He just, we would love to have him on. Talks about everything that we, we talk about. Spies, the occult, UFOs, and all kinds of crazy weird stuff. 
Professor Richard B. Spence. We've So we've talked about him before with other weird occult and cult stuff. But here, there's an episode that's all just about the connection between UFOs and the occult. And of course, there's a bunch of wild, weird connections to this. But it also includes, uh, this is not long after the, what is called the golden age of flying saucers. Right. Which would have been uh, the early 50s. 1952 is a huge year for that. So this is just a little over a decade later. Right. Here's where we get back to the connection to Aerojet, where Donald Trump and Vincent Alvarez and Tim Trueblood were all working. Aerojet was founded by a brilliant rocket scientist and physicist named Theodore von Karman in 1936. After a few years of experimentation and trying to get into the rocketry field. And in fact, they wound up needing some capital and some other, I think, access to chemical research so that they wound up merging or being acquired by General Tire, which if you're really old, mm -hmm. you might remember General Tires. They had a big G logo. So it became Aerojet Gen for General mm -hmm. Tire, and those two companies worked together. So Von Karman founded the company, and he is considered one of the key figures in the development of supersonic and hypersonic flight. Mm -hmm. He was a forefather of research in that area. He was a Hungarian Jewish man who had left Budapest in 1930 to both get away from Nazism and also to take a role as a director at the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He founded Aerojet with one of his graduate students and their experimental rocketry collaborator, Jack Parsons. Mm -hmm. As Forrest has said, and we have said, Jack Parsons was an occultist and a follower of Aleister Crowley. Okay, do you want to hear my notes from the course as a summary? Because I, I did boil them down, but we got a spot. We don't want to make them too long. Yeah. But I did take some notes from the lecture. Would you like to hear them? Yeah, sure. Okay, then. Well, this is from the new series, and you can find it if you go to wondrium.com slash legends. And it's called Secrets of the Occult. And the professor is, uh, as we said, Richard B. Spence. And it's not just about UFOs. It's every aspect of the occult. If you like any of this kind of stuff, it's all fascinating. I'm going to watch every one of these. But for right now, I was more focused on the connection between UFOs and the occult. And there seems to have always been one. It is inextricable. Now, as Professor Spence says, is that UFOs as objects could be debatable. That's one thing. Do they exist? Right. But connected to that, of course, and separate, but also part of it is the phenomenon. And that's always what we talk about, how people react to this. How do they get into this? What do they believe? That's the phenomenon part. So there's a huge psychological and sociological aspect to this. How do people behave? That's why we always look at this. Well, a lot of that is delving into the occult. And when you lay it out, like it's always been connected. So here's a rundown of my notes from the lecture number 12, UFOs and the occult. And speaking directly to this, I thought that this is interesting. In occultism, one must be worthy of enlightenment. And so during the golden age, you had the four Georges, as we said in the spot. And in 1946, the year probably leading into 1947, as you know, that was a huge year. Roswell, June 1947, Kenneth Arnold had his storied sighting near Mount Rainier of the, I believe, nine crescent shape objects, which he said were kind of bouncing and, and skipping off the atmosphere there. But it, as it was reported, they misreported them as flying saucers, which they really weren't. But that term stuck. And that's how we know them as flying saucers. But even Arnold, I believe, he came to believe that those objects may be somewhat biological, that they might be creatures in and of themselves. If you look at the movie AI with, with Spielberg, those were robots, but they're kind of sentient and they've evolved to the point where, well, they're beings. Right. And maybe they have their own needs, the physical needs. But getting back to 1946 and 47, in 1946, John Jack Whiteside Parsons, as you said, a follower of Aleister Crowley, along with his buddy at the time, L. Ron Hubbard, who was a naval officer, I think retired, but by that point, they were friends, and it was Parsons who tried to incarnate or manifest the goddess Babylon, the Scarlet Woman of Revelation. Because I think he was lonely and wanted a girlfriend. So there's a whole <laughs> other weird story. And, and you want to, I le first learned about this, geez, back in the 80s, late 80s, uh, there's a book by Mike Davis called City of Quartz. It's just fascinating stuff. It's a thick read, but it's got a lot of juicy stuff in it. Well, Parsons ends up meeting a redhead named Marjorie Cameron. And he starts to believe that maybe she is the one who is the Scarlet Woman. 
an incarnation of Babylon. And some believe at this point that Parsons really did open up a portal and unbeknownst to him and unintentionally flying saucers and demonic entities that were basically representations in these physical forms of demonic entities came through and they couldn't stop it. As we said, also in the spot, uh, there was a, another shadowy group in 1952 that called themselves the Collins Elite. And that was former U.S. military and intelligence officials. And they also believe that UFOs are perhaps somehow connected spiritually, supernaturally to demonic entities from another dimension. And what they're after is to consume human souls for that soul energy. Because what else do we have? We're a bunch of smelly meat bags running around. And we have nothing really else to offer other than to study us. But what we do have is soul energy, which perhaps is eternal. Yeah, that's right, Copper Top. <laughs> that, that's exactly <laughs> right. So right there, you have a group that to me sounds like the Millennium Group. Remember the spinoff from the X-Files? In this case, you have a bunch of shadowy groups already kind of buying into this idea. Now, in 1952, Jack Parsons dies in a mysterious explosion in June yes. of that year. It's not known. People, Some people believe that he was assassinated because he had a lot of secrets, a lot of knowledge, and seemed a bit kooky. Yeah, well, there was speculation that he was playing with uh, fulminant mercury and he dropped right. it and his hands were sweaty. But then the people that knew him said he actually worked in a very safe environment. And he was very right. clinical. Here's what's interesting. He was only 37 years old. After mm -hmm. the explosion, he was found mortally wounded. Right. Several limbs were gone. He had a hole in his face, but he was alive. Yeah. And they took him to the hospital and he died 37 minutes later. So 37 uh -huh. years old, died 37 minutes later. There's a lot of, lot of strangeness there with Mr. Parsons, the co-founder of JPL. Yeah. I mean, brilliant guy, just was into a lot of strange things and they don't really care for that on the military side because it's a lot of money and it's a lot of uh, people's safety and right. defense capabilities. So you could say perhaps that they were worried about him. It's time to take him out if you're of a mind of that kind of conspiracy. Well, here's the other strange thing. Again, a lot happens in 1952. It's a weird year where so much of a uh, golden age of UFO kind of stuff is happening, but also occultism. And in that same year, there's a huge flap of UFOs swarming Washington, D.C., now, Marjorie Cameron, remember the, the girlfriend of Jack, but Marjorie Cameron interprets the swarm, the flap here, as cosmic acknowledgement of Parsons' death, as Professor Spence alludes to. And here's the weird thing. She becomes friends with George Van Tassel, another one of the four Georges, you know, of the golden age of flying saucers. And all these guys started sharing information, and they all kind of dabbled in the occult. And so people started wondering, did Parsons open up some kind of portal? Is there a weird connection? Because all this weird stuff's happening around his death and the things that he was dabbling in and rockets and just, yeah, it's very rich. Well, there you go. And so that is one of the co-founders of JPL. He's connected to Von Karman, who we mentioned, who founded Aerojet that... Don Shrum and his two buddies all worked for. So by the time this story happened, Aerojet was nearly 30 years old. In the final oddity, Von Karman was also part of a group of prominent Hungarian scientists jokingly referred to as the Martians. <laughs> and so check this out. This was a joke made by Hungarian German American physicist Leo Szilard in a book by Georgie Marx called The Voice of the Martians. Now, you might remember we covered the Fermi paradox back in episode 22 of our show, back in August of 2015, which basically says, if there are aliens, why aren't they here? If you do the math, right. they should be out there. They should have gotten here. Sillard's reply to this in Marx's book was, quote, they are among us, but they call themselves Hungarians, end quote. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was a joke. So Marx backed right. up the joke by saying that von Karman and a few of his Hungarian compatriots' names could not be found in Budapest, but they all had craters named after them on the moon. Yeah. And in fact, von Karman has one named after him on Mars. I think we've also mentioned physicist Leo Zillard in our Nazi Bell episode. If you remember, and I'm just going off the top of, uh, at the bottom of my memory, Zillard was good friends with Albert Einstein. And That's right. no one would take Zillard seriously when he said, hey, you got to look into this. You got to step up your nuclear research because the Nazis are really working hard on this. And nobody took it seriously. They didn't think they had the power 
or the capability. But finally, he was able to convince Einstein, who was able to convince President Roosevelt. And then that's when they took it seriously. And Everything that's when, uh, you know, you got Operation Paperclip or whatever. It's all connected. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, fascinating time in history, certainly. The long and short of all this is, is that the Martians were basically a super brilliant, nerdy rat pack of Hungarian rocket scientists. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting in tangent, but it, it connects this idea of Martians and UFOs and Aleister Crowley. All of this stuff is in this big soup. And now you've just connected it. I forgot, because you're right. I forgot about the connection to the Nazi bell. Yeah. Really, it's a small world, we'll say. There's also a connection to that other story, Orfeo Angelucci. That's right. Yeah. Because he also worked at a aerospace company. That's right. Yeah, Skunk Works at Lockheed, uh, Burbank, yeah. not too far from my neighborhood, all that going down in a similar fashion. He's also a worker there. I think he worked in also something kind of toxic, which was the Lucite, Lexan, Plexiglass. That's it. Yeah. The bubbles yeah. that covered uh, the gunner stations on these bombers. And so it was also very highly toxic. There's a lot of strange parallels, of, especially with two people who had no connection to each other at all. Right. Torres and Uriarte's book points out something interesting about what working at Aerojet was like, though. It was dangerous, as Forrest was just talking about. They all were inhaling incredibly unhealthy amounts yeah. of trichloroethylene, or TCE. Right. This could lead to lifelong health problems for everyone that worked there and even their significant others. In fact, Aerojet's location in Rancho Cordova is an EPA Superfund site yeah. responsible for catastrophic damage to the water table in the area. Right. 5,900 acres are contaminated. Aerojet disposed of unknown quantities of hazardous waste, mm -hmm. including TCE and other rocket propellant chemicals. 27 square miles of groundwater there is undrinkable. And in order to put it right, they I think back in 2011, they were ordered to pay $60 million to yeah. mitigate it. And they have to purify 25 million gallons of water a day to keep it from encroaching further into the local water supply. So it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, here's what Donald Trump said is that at the time, these are, uh, I don't know if they just didn't have any better technology, but chemistry wise, these were the solvents used to clean the parts that were going to be welded. So he was right. he was in them. And as Donald Trump said, even with a respirator, your throat burned. Yeah. When he got home, his wife had to try and wash the yellowness out of his white shirts because it was basically coming out of his pores. He said the yes. bed sheets would be yellowed from this. At the time, he was able to kind of get through it. But a lot of these stories that you'll hear about, there are elements of poor health in a strange way or health side effects connected, possibly unconnected, possibly long lasting with these events. And here's another thing I want to make clear. There is no implication of hallucinations associated no. with TCE or the other chemicals involved here. We, we have looked into that. So right. the side effects are health related. It's cancers, various things like that. But there's not a hallucination scenario going on there just because I know somebody's going to be like, well, yeah, that's what these guys all have in common. Aside from working at these places is they're hallucinating because of the chemicals they're exposed to, which right. actually is a pretty good hypothesis. Well, but that's not the case uh, yeah. that we could find with this particular stuff. No, and, and here's the thing is that radon coming up from the floorboards doesn't always make you see ghosts and aliens. Right. It's a, right. It, it can have an effect. It can be an element of that, but I don't think, uh, I, I think people often look for something that explains everything. And I've never found uh, one explanation unless it was uh, biochemical naturally that was responsible for a lot of the explanation. This is just, there's too many weird elements that cannot be explained. Well, let's talk a little bit about the event itself. I want to talk about the ship, actually, the, the size of this ship, mm -hmm. how it traveled. It was dead silent. It was right. moving exceptionally fast. And also, it's one point that uh, we didn't mention in our telling of the story, but there was a point at which it shot way up into the sky, stayed visible, yeah. but went way up and then instantly came back down. So then we get into that whole thing of conversations that you and I have had before about how is this propulsion working, which connects back to... Secret of Skinwalker Ranch and yep. uh, Dr. Travis there talking about how could this stuff happen? Right. It's not following the laws of physics. And it's the yeah. same thing as Commander David Fravor's footage. What are these things doing the way they're tilting and changing and shifting? They don't have control surfaces. They don't have any of the kinds of things that we know that allow things to fly. And they're moving right. at impossible speeds. So that's happening here. That's a common element 
And this is back in 1964. That's what he's describing. This is a long time yeah. before we could even come, because now people are like, well, some of this stuff we're seeing or that's being reported, it's drones. It's military drones from China yeah. or whatever. And there's no doubt that there's secret operations happening with all kinds of drones and surveillance equipment. But those are the ones that are buzzing <laughs> destroyers and packs well, and controlled yeah. packs. It's different from this kind of stuff. It is, and the movement's different, and there are differences, and then there are similarities. And what we see here is his initial description, which I'm going to guess that he did not know about, Mr. Shrum. He first described it, it was bouncing kind of up and down. Now, yeah. that doesn't happen unless you're a really terrible drone pilot. You right. Know, that's not happening unless there's something wrong with the aircraft, if it was man-made. If it's right. this, there's some reason to it, as uh, John Keel explains. Sometimes there's a falling leaf motion, and some people believe yeah. it could be like a shiny object on a pendulum that a hypnotist is trying to get you to stare at, because there's a hypnotic effect to this. Here, I'm not so sure. I think it's part of the motion uh, that this thing does. Yeah. You just don't understand it, and then you're trying to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, yeah, right. because you're trying to apply human logic and reason to this when it's not of any of that it's just doing its own thing for some reason that's the way they move right that's why he thinks it's like well that's not a very slow moving uh meteorite is it or because it's not following ballistic trajectory it's moving in a strange fashion kind of bobbing up and down and at first though he thought well you know what does that is maybe a helicopter with a light on it could be going up and down maybe they're looking for me but unfortunately that's not what it was and then when the when the ship came over Let's talk about that because at mm -hmm. the first point, the ship comes over and he's like, oh, this isn't good. He gets back in the tree. It comes around to an angle where he can see it. Right. And he describes seeing it in the moonlight, which we'll talk about later. But and he sees these windows and these windows are huge on the side of it. They're yeah. like 30 by 20 feet. Yeah. yeah. 30 feet tall, about 20 feet width wise and maybe right. 10 feet or more between each other. Now, if you want to picture how they were laid out, because again, we've seen the illustrations here. Imagine the photos that people put up on the staircase wall, <laughs> on the wall. That, yes, it's exactly. Like they're, they're, that's a good analogy. That's what I thought, because they're big, yeah. but they're kind of stepped at an angle here, but all, uh, you know, they're square. They would right. be square with the banister. So that's what he sees at first. And the way he describes it is that they were shimmering. And this is what's interesting is that in the book, he will say that, uh, like, if you took a piece of foil and you you waved it near the campfire, the way that the light would bounce and play off of it, that's what he described it as shimmering. And here's what I found interesting, if you want to go that far and think about the tech, is that a ship that would have to fit those dimensions and no larger, as he described, maybe something that could seat six beings, occupants, yep. came out of it. And it would have to pass a plane. It, you know, it wasn't Indrid Cold's rusty lantern UFO that had the squeaky right. car door. This thing passed through a membrane of some kind, which uh, would have to stand space travel or whatever was coming out. Basically, it was very, it was very bright. And he just saw this thing drop down quickly and he didn't know what it was because again it's very dark he just sees this object kind of fall out and go down the side of the ravine and of course this is you got to imagine like his state of mind it's like what, what is all this this is not he knows rockets he he's kind of in this world he knows metals he's probably not bad at judging dimensions too because he's yeah, routinely exactly. working around larger transportation devices where he has to stand nearby and weld and put together and take apart and all that stuff. So that's absolutely true. He he's has a trained observer, as you like to say. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, yes, that's the, the technical term, but he's also welding. You're talking about rocket engines for Saturn, the Gemini missions, the thrust boxes or whatever creates the thruster. That's what he worked on as well as welding right. and painting. So he's got intimate knowledge of at least human space devices. Yes. So uh, a lot more than me. He has a lot better judgment on this than I would. Well, listen to his description here, because then the idea of a mothership, and as he called it a module, he didn't say a landing craft, but those ideas at this point would be very new to the general public, as it was described in the book. The Mercury missions were just one astronaut in a tiny capsule going up, making some orbits and coming right back down. You wouldn't have a concept of like the lunar lander yet, uh, where you have a, a command module that separates, you have a landing module, and then they join up again. But that's kind of what this is. So listen to this, because it not only involves the motion, but a form of communication and a form, you could say, of tethering. So this is from page 31, quote, I sat there and watched it. It must be four or five minutes or so. And then something came out of the second panel. And all I could see was a kind of flash. 
something went straight down the hill, Shrum said. What he had just observed was the middle panel of the three suddenly flaring or flashing, almost like something taking a flash picture. Then, immediately after the flash, a dark object seemed to fall away from the panel, moving quickly down into the canyon below and disappearing into the darkness. It soon became clear to the witness that this second object was a smaller UFO, which we will refer to as a, quote, scout ship. Shrum called it a module. It could also be called a lander. Like the mother ship it came out of, the new vehicle moved in absolute silence, displaying technologies of speed and stealth that were beyond any known to mankind. Shrum believes that the strange beings he encountered a few minutes later came out of the scout ship, which he thinks later landed perhaps half a mile away from his position. Shrum later explained, quote, it went pretty fast. I saw a big flash of light as it left. I couldn't tell what it was. I just saw a dark object shoot right down, and there was a flash when it came out. Yeah, so it's freaky when you think about that. And it's this is such a weird thing for me to compare this to, but I think about the movie Starman, which I'm yeah. really fond of. I, I watch <laughs> it too. about once a year. Aww. And in that movie, there's some, ed, you know, as a former editor, there's these sequences of events happening and mm -hmm. there's flashes and that's an editorial trick. And it's a little different, but that's what I thought about. I thought about this yeah. thing, just, you know, a flash that's blinding almost. And then something right. comes out and it's just all tech that's like, you can't wrap your head around it in any way. He's trying to describe it, but he doesn't even have the tools to describe what he's seeing because it's so far beyond anything that we've ever achieved at that point and even now. One through line with a lot of these stories is that light is very important and that's yeah. Terry Lovelace and the beam, like the narrow beam that came down from the ship onto the, the fire, remember? Yes. These things have lights. Lights are very important and uh, not only colorful and pretty, they have different applications. So it's another currency of the universe light. And here's the thing about this, though, that reminded me the flash of light, which is also often described. You know, what made me think of is the invasion of Chestnut Ridge and the, the terrific account that's described in Seth Breedlove's documentary of the same name, where a woman describes being on her porch, and this is a, a rural Pennsylvania. Uh, she thinks some hooligans are messing with her can collection and her bottle collection on her porch. She's like, okay, that's not going to happen. She's going to chase him off with a shotgun. Comes out with a double barrel, and I believe it was very large, a big white furred Bigfoot type creature. And yeah. of course, uh, yeah, her first instinct, like a lot of my older relatives who have passed, shoot first, ask questions later. And so she opens up on this thing with a shotgun and she said it made a flash, like a giant bright camera flash, and then disappeared. Vaporized, was just right. gone. Right. And I can't remember if uh, the other sighting about this UFO landing and these other types of Bigfoot type beings, I think with green glowing eyes and the older son uh, who had the rifle, I think took a shot at one of them and they had, uh, they were using tracer rounds and he think he, he pretty much hit one and it kind of like slumped over a little bit, kept going. And then I think they disappeared and I can't remember if there was a flash with that one, but anyway, flashes are big. Yeah. Yeah. And then they just keep turning up back in their nearest convenient dimensions with wounds. And they're like, ah, I got shot. <laughs> I'm not well, going there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or, or it's like the Matrix. It's like you can heal yourself once you go back, right? Ask anyone who's been burgled, myself included, and they'll tell you it's one of the worst feelings there is. And they'll probably also tell you that one of the second worst feelings is if you had a way to prevent it, but you kept putting it off. Yeah, if you thought about securing your home, but you've been putting it off, like Forrest just said, you're going to want to listen up. Right now, Astonishing Legends listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year, and you don't want to miss it. Oh, yeah. And here's why I love it. Because back in the mid 2000s, I wish I had all the high tech cameras, sensors and professional monitoring service that Simply Safe offers now and at its affordable price. I got the only DIY system I could afford at the time, but it was clunky. And getting one after you've been robbed is like closing the barn doors after the horse is gone. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report a third year in a row. Doesn't sound like your old system, Forrest, won any awards. I don't think. 
<laughs> what? Are you past <laughs> system shaming me? Well, look, yes. look, you're right. It was basically just a motion detector with an alarm, which no neighbor is going to respond to. But I feel totally protected now because Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, HD security cameras for inside and out, smarter ways to detect motion that alert you only when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. And Simply Safe's 24 7 professional monitoring service costs under $1 a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. And with the top rated Simply Safe app, stay in complete control of your system anytime, anywhere. Arm or disarm, unlock for a guest, access your cameras, or adjust system settings, which is super handy if you have repair people or guests for the holidays. Yeah, don't wait for something bad to happen before you take action, and don't miss your chance for massive savings on our favorite security system. Get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash AL today. This is their biggest discount of the year, folks. That's simplysafe.com slash AL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Hey, do you love plot twists? Well, yeah. I mean, of course, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, M. Knight. Do you love spoilers? Absolutely not. You know that about me. I hate spoilers. Do you love way overpaying for your mobile phone service and data? Well, that's a double no. Of course not. Okay, because I love to confound you as much as I love great service at a great price. Here's a spoiler for you. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. And now for the plot twist. There isn't one. Mint Mobile really does offer premium wireless service from just 15 bucks a month. Uh, yeah, thanks. I already knew all that. But what I still can't figure out is why everyone else listening to us is still way overpaying, as you said. Yeah. If, if you don't yeah. know what you're paying for your phone service, well, you should. Go look at your bill. Is it as low as that? Is it double, mm -hmm. triple? Embarrassed to say. Hate your bill and don't want to look? Why not spend the savings on something you need or want? We know, we know. You hate that bill because deep down you realized you've been trapped into a two-year contract with a bunch of crazy fees you didn't anticipate, and then you got suckered in with free subscriptions and streaming services that you never really use. And then you keep forgetting to cancel, and now you've been paying full price for months. You know, that's actually part of these companies' business model, right? Yeah. Counting on the fact that you'll forget to cancel? Yeah, it's insidious. I had to use a separate app to find and then shut down all those subscriptions I wasn't using, and, and I've saved a ton since, but yeah. you don't get any of that with Mint Mobile, and you don't need to do anything besides sign up to save. Yeah, there's no need for the hate, no need to waste your money or for forensic accounting because Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. And at Mint, families start at two lines. So stop losing money for nothing and start saving it for the holidays. Get premium wireless from just 15 bucks a month and no unexpected plot twists at mintmobile.com slash AL. That's mintmobile.com slash AL. Seriously, you'll make your wallet very happy at mintmobile.com slash AL. This is Jennifer. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Well, I want to talk a little bit about these beings too. Mm -hmm. And why is there two types of beings? You know, I call them the little guys and the book goes out of its way to point out in a couple of places that he's not really sure that the first ones that came were shorter than the robot ones. But mm -hmm. there seems to be an implication that maybe it was that way. And he explains this and this makes sense. So this is a, another one of the things that I think lends to the veracity of the story. He talks about how he's 12 feet up in the tree and these things are down below him. He's got a pretty good height for, a per I mean, it's not super high, but he's up yeah. high enough that it's difficult looking down on them to, to determine how tall they are right. because he's looking down on them. It's like when you go on Google Earth and you look at trees, it's like <laughs> you the satellites, sure. you know, you're looking kind of down the tree. So he, he wasn't really sure that the robot ones were bigger than these other humanoid ones. But you mm -hmm. got, so you got these two types. You got the first ones, they're coming through the shrubs for five or 10 minutes, making these terrifying noises as they're getting closer and closer to him. He can't tell whether they're wearing masks or it's a spacesuit or whatever, but they've got these goggles or mm -hmm. you know big black saucer eyes. But they seem to be, it seems like, relatively organic creatures wearing a suit, <sighs> which would imply that maybe they can't just walk around naked on Earth because it doesn't agree <laughs> with their biological makeup possibly there's an implication there mm. but then you got the second set you got the robots that come from the east they came from right. a different direction 
They avoided the shrubs, but the face at least and head was definitely metallic. And in my mind, you look at some of the sketches in the book and it looks like the Iron Giant. It's the cartoon sketch of the the giant robot jaw coming down. And again, this speaks to, look, it's folly to apply human rational logic to any of this stuff. I think yeah. it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would they do this? You know, or why would they design it this way? We don't know. But the way it's described, and perhaps this is like an injured cold thing, this is what Don would be used to or more accustomed to seeing in 1964, the kind of technology, and maybe his mind filled in the rest. Yeah. Because I do believe that he did encounter strange beings, and he described them as he saw them. But you got to wonder, is like, is part of that, well, that was what the occult folks believed, is that there was some shape-shifting going on, or there was something about the mind-body connection to the experiencer. This is what I wondered about them, is that the way they're described, as he said, the first set had joints. Well, there were bellows in the... Elbows. Uh, joints. In the knees, yeah. In the elbows and yeah. knees. And if, folks, if you don't remember, and again, I'm old enough to... I, my space toys, because I had some uh, space uh, robot types, and there was a whole brand that had... Uh, Space toys that you could put uh, these bendable figures in, and they had spacesuits, and that seems very much like that, where they would have these bellows. It wasn't so much like the really advanced concepts you see, perhaps in modern Star Trek, where it's just a skin-tight suit, and it moves, and it's perfectly comfortable, and all that. This seems a little more retro. Right. And the way he described the other robot with the articulated fingers that look like a medieval gauntlet. And that's how I pictured in my mind is that there, there's joints, but there, it's mechanical and it's a little clunky. Exactly. But then again, they have this amazing technology that you can't do with 1960s human space technology, where that's really primitive to them. There's a lot of pictures of the location in Aliens in the Forest because Shrum gave them mm -hmm. all these pictures. And when you look at that terrain, that is not going to be easy to walk through in some crazy suit. I'm just telling you, as somebody who's hiked on that yeah. kind of terrain, it's hard to do <laughs> in the best hiking boots you've got. I mean, it's like you're going to twist your ankle. You're going to like all kinds of problems are going to be happening, which, and I, I will call back to that when people say, yeah. oh, well, it was a group of kids. It was whatever. We'll talk about that later. But like, you can't just go traipsing around in this kind of terrain, especially in no. some big, bulky, crazy suit. And here's the other thing that, that kind of was, was strange, and it made me think that whatever the first pair or the first being was, was also some type of android or some type of humanoid, not fully biological, right? Not not a, yeah. a not a wimpy flesh and blood creature like myself that would get all scratched up and, and start to whimper. That's what he was amazed at, is that he it made a lot of racket, and he's like, how are they getting through that? Right. And, and why wouldn't you go around it? You could have gone around it, but it's like they went right through it. Like you you would need a machete. But even then, we were talking about this on some other endeavor, Scott and I were thinking about. It takes a long time to hack your way through that, and it's really thick stuff. Yeah. And if it's like the brush that I know, like creosote or any of those, it's like it's not easy to saw through. Right. You would need uh, some kind of like a chainsaw. And so, or you're just going to get really all scratched up and you're going to be covered in sticky pitch and this and that. But they managed to do it. Now, what's interesting is that, as he said, perhaps that information of like, okay, that wasn't too smart, fellas. This other type of robot, why don't you kind of go around that? Right. And it seemed to do right. that. It's like, okay, that that was not efficient. You take the other route. It doesn't go far out of its way, but it avoids the really thick brush down in the canyon. Well, and the other thing about these ones, and I'm, I'm just going to call them the shorter ones, whether they were shorter or not, but yeah. the first ones that showed up is that they were very aloof. They were very yeah. focused on their investigation. And they seem to be really interested in the manzanita bushes that were right. in the area, which is not a rare plant in California, although there are versions of it that are extremely rare. So what, one is so rare that they found it at the Presidio and they don't tell anyone where it is. It's mm. like the rarest, one of the rarest mm -hmm. plants on earth. Mm. But when you look up manzanita, this actually was under a section about them on the internet. This was, I think this was on Wikipedia. Just listen to ways that they're used in folk medicine. Native Americans in Northern California make a tisane. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that right, T-I-S-A-N-E. I hope it's like a tincture. Yeah, like a tincture from manzanita leaves to treat poison oak rash. Oh. The leaves contain chemicals with a mildly disinfectant quality and can be used for mild urinary tract infections. Oh. The berries of the tree can be turned into a cider by mashing, pouring an equal amount of water over the paste, and then straining it. In Native American cultures, this cider is then used to treat stomach ailments mm -hmm. and promote appetite. The berries have also been used to treat bronchitis and kidney problems. 
The leaves of the manzanita also have many medicinal purposes. Chewing the leaves of the manzanita tree into a poultice can treat open sores and ease headaches after application. Chewing on the leaves without ingestion can cure stomach issues such as cramps and aches. Infusion of the leaves can also treat ailments such as diarrhea and severe colds. I love all that. Yeah, so maybe these guys came down. One of them's got a UTI. The other one's got <laughs> diarrhea. Oh, come on They're now. like, we have got, we are so far from home. It would be more of a rust thing. Yeah, it would be like yeah, Bender. Yeah, we, we need some uh, help here. Because that's why they're like, right. they're like, wait, what's that thing in the tree? And it's like, are you, Carl, I got to go. I got to find <laughs> something now. We got to get this dealt with. Uh, very uncomfortable. So, I cannot sit for the next 130 million miles. But here, here's the thing. <laughs> we are doing the same thing in the rainforests of Brazil. There are so many botanical things we don't have no idea about that occur naturally. And right. we're doing it to our own unknown places. And so that's, uh, you know, again, this is the scene in E.T. where the cute little E.T.s are bumping around and collecting plants yeah. and, you know, and then putting it and then, you know, one gets separated. Yeah, it's also a scene in uh, Rob Christopherson and Todd Purse's web comic uh, yeah. Welcome UFO People, which uh, you guys should check out on their yes. Patreons. We talked about it on our last junk drawer. If you didn't hear that, you wouldn't have heard that if you're not a patron of us. But we're telling you to look for Welcome UFO People on the Internet because it's really great. Because mm -hmm. there's one of those that portrays these little robots running around picking flowers and, you know, going back to their ship and taking the flowers. That's a lot less uh, terrifying than this, this one. And yes. that uh, I would say that this is all very weird and then uh it takes a turn because you're observing something very strange but it's that moment in every case especially every every horror movie like something weird's going on and then they turn and they look at you and then you know that they've noticed you and now yeah. their attention is on you right and so with the other ones these robots they seem more like they were going to be the enforcers yeah right they're mechanical or they seem more mechanical or maybe it's the same creatures, but they're just wearing a more robust suit that has more abilities. We we don't know. And he perhaps, wasn't sure. Perhaps. He wasn't sure they were really, he called them robots because they seem to be mechanical, moving mechanically and awkward and uncomfortable. But maybe that's because the gravity is different here than where they're from, or the suit is constricting in some way. It's hard to really know why they were uncomfortable. But I mean, imagine how you are when you're in your scuba suit, for those of you that dive, and then you have to get out and walk on the dock. It could be just something like that. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, that's a good point. But look to uh, Star Wars. You know, there you have your C three PO type robots, and then you have your mechanic bots, right? And they're yeah, uh, they're boxy, they're clunky. I mean, they move better than this, but they what was the one with R2 the two D4. legs. You know, and he's kind of oh, like he had a bad hobbling. motivator, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> So to me, it sounded like a robot for a different tool set, right? A different skill set. It did different things. It's a tool that's a little more blunt, clunky or whatever, but it has different functions than these other ones. He described Donald Trump with the face, which is also kind of creepy, is that he couldn't really make out the face of the first ones other than it seemed really dark or black. Whatever the texture was, was very dark. And it did have some kind of a wide flat nose, but disturbingly much, much lower than where a human nose would be. Yeah. And he never saw a mouth, I don't think. Or no. Head. So it was just the eyes, the nose, never saw ears really either. And it was the eyes that would creep him out for the rest of his life too. And his uh, horrible nightmares they would have. Yeah. Just saying those eyes, that's not possible. And just, uh, uh, yeah. And the other thing about the robots is they would go to a certain point and then they would just stop and stand there, sometimes right under the tree. And they'd just right. stand there doing nothing. Awaiting an order, maybe? Yeah, that's the impression I got. So the impression you get is it's not like the Queen's Guard. It's not a matter of discipline. Look at me. I'm standing perfectly still. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you mess with my hat. It's more like this is a program. It's a computer. And right now it doesn't <laughs> have any code to run. Right. So it's just going to chill until you download a new set of orders to it. Right. Now, it could be biomechanical. And maybe both were because the other one, well, the other one did sound more mechanical. These sound maybe perhaps a hybrid again. Something that is part flesh, part uh, grown, call it uh, flesh over a metal skeleton, whatever, where do we yeah. want to, however you want to describe it. But you're right. And the way that it was described by Donald is that it seemed like to him that they were, somebody was up in the mothership or whatever, observing and just saying like, okay, uh, hold tight. We're going to come up with a plan here. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and then be like, well, what do you think you should do? Like, yeah, they're thumbing through a three ring binder, like in the Apollo mission. Should right? we get the guy? Get the guy? Yeah, get the guy. Okay. All get right. Why don't you try and grab the guy? 
And then it's like, yeah. oh, okay. And then they that's start your plan, doing get her. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's the whole thing. And uh, and the other thing is with the robots, they had uh, reddish orange eyes, yeah. like the Mothman. Right. I don't want to try to compare it to everything because it's like, oh, no. it had red eyes, Mothman. Oh, this, yeah. you know, whatever. But like, it does make you wonder those common elements. And then the communication, right. the whole the sounding like birds. So, so this brings a big question for me, yeah. by the way. Why do they look like people? Torso, head, neck, arms, legs, hands. But they talk like birds. What's going on there? <laughs> don't, are don't you a apply. bird? Are you a person? What are you? Owls Forever After, the sound of owls, would trigger something in Don and he would have a panic attack because it sounded right. like the same. So it was that kind of like, you know what morning doves? Like, ooh, 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 yeah. or, or hooting of an owl. And it's like, is that a packet of information? Is that just like a ding, you know, that yeah. you're uh, You've got a microwave? Mail. Yeah, what's <laughs> yeah, right. Is that acknowledgement? We don't know, but yeah. they made a sound. That's the thing is that our communications, our technology doesn't have to. Right. We have things make a sound to alert us humans who aren't plugged into it that your microwave popcorn's done. Yeah. The watch is beeping. It's at the top of the hour. We have things that alert us that we're not connected to. They shouldn't need that, but they do, but they, they make a sound. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the vapor or the gas. All yes, right? let's get onto the gas. Yeah, so what was that that knocked Don out? I did a little research on this. I can't figure it out, honestly, because he said he couldn't breathe. It could have been any gas that would be an asphyxiant would be one with zero oxygen. So some of these, mm -hmm. they're not dangerous on their own. But no. if there's at 100% concentration, they are. Nitrogen, helium, argon, for example, all three of those could knock you out if they are at 100% concentration. Inhaling 100% nitrogen can knock you out in just one or two breaths, but it can also yeah. kill you within 40 seconds. Don did not die, and he seemed like no. he was down sometimes for a few minutes. But here's something I found in a safety video from some government website about industrial accidents, but it, it said that mm -hmm. inhaling nitrogen affects judgment, coordination, and your ability to exert strength which I thought was interesting. Also, it deprives your brain of oxygen. So you get to a point where you mm -hmm. really can't think at all. Nitrogen is also invisible. It's not white. Whatever he described was coming out of the robot's mouth was like a white vapor. None of these. Right. They're all odorless, tasteless, and colorless. Whether it's helium, uh, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, that could have done it. What was it that he inhaled? Why was it white? Was it just a temperature difference thing? Or how did it knock him out? Was it just asphyxiation? Or was there something more going on there? Was it some sort of anesthesia? From the description and the action of it, I would guess that it was a special recipe blend because if you shot a, a jet of gas at somebody in an open, wide open area, and as Don described it, there was a breeze. It, it, he was standing uh, downwind of the creature, which is why the traveling of the vapor was more efficient. It came out of the uh, <laughs> the iron jaw robot out of its mouth. Weirdly, after it put its hand up to its mouth. So there's some action there. Yeah. It's not automatic. Yeah. There was some action there. As uh, someone else described, it's like uh, the alien. Oh, you know what? That was one of our Halloween stories. The alien that was in the M. Night Shyamalan movie Signs. Oh, yeah. Where a little jet comes out and a noxious gas comes out of the wrist. That seems more like an animal or insect. That's right. uh, like a stink bug. You know? right. Here, this is being manufactured. But to me, the way that it it came out of the robot after it put its uh, hand up to its mouth and this gas comes up is that it, it stayed in a very tight cloud as it made its way up to dawn. Yeah, and that's the other thing. You'd have to blast a lot of a big jet of helium. Yeah, how are you doing this? Because gas, it, it, here's the one thing I do remember from my college chemistry class. Right. Gas expands to occupy the space allowed. So exactly. So we're out in the open here. Right. And he's 12 feet up in a tree. I mean, imagine just yeah. if you had parked a car at the base of the tree and we're like, oh, I'm going to get him some carbon monoxide. <laughs> and it's like, you wouldn't even be able to get it to go up the tree to the right place. Like. That's what I'm saying. Could it have been nanotech, you know? Uh, possibly it may something here's the thing. with more they had more control it wasn't over. totally efficient that's another big theme of this story is that everything that these uh, highly advanced aliens do and pretty much every uh, alien story is that they don't get everything right they're not perfect yeah. they're yeah. kind of bumbling around here and i think you know again if you're going to read uh, some kind of thought process into this some kind of mission plan to this it's like well what do we got on the robots that could uh, knock him out because we, we want to take this guy back for a closer look at least for tonight we got this gas let's try that 
it's a little bit like Hitchhiker's Guide, isn't it? It's, it's like we've got this amazing <laughs> well, tech, but yeah. we're, we don't really know how to use it or how it's going to work in right. this scenario. Good example here. Like, the, is it the Vogons who have yeah. uh, like these laser pack, you know, these these weapons on their chest, but they're horrible shots. Yeah. So like yeah. laser, they're going all over the place. They never hit anything. It just doesn't make any sense. But they do have the technology here. It sounded to me it was ad hoc. Like, well, we got this, and he's a biological creature. We know the chemical uh, makeup of it was at twenty six percent oxygen, and uh, you know, the rest is right. nitrogen, helium, little bits of this and that. If we increase that, he'll pass out for a bit. We can grab him. Right. Because it didn't totally work, and they didn't have any other plan. Let's keep trying this. Let's just do this over and over. Yeah. yeah, maybe he'll get tired, or maybe he'll just fall out of the tree, or maybe nine's his limit on Schnitzengruben, and he's going to fall out of the tree, and they'll grab him. You know, whatever it was, it just it was pretty clunky, but that's all they had, because they're not from here. Speaking of not being from here, here's another thing that I thought was interesting yes. that Torres and Uriarte brought up in their book, Aliens in the Forest, was the fact that when he found himself alone the next morning, he climbed down out of the tree. He's trying to figure out if it's safe to get out of there. Right. He noticed that the coins that he had thrown down mm -hmm. as one of the many distractions and things he was trying to throw at them to get them to go away were gone. The yeah. coins were gone. Other stuff was there. There was other debris there. His canteen was there. Other stuff that he had thrown down, remnants of his burnt hat, whatever. But the coins were gone. And one of the things that they pointed out in the book, which I thought was a great observation, is that it's like it's a perfect archaeological sample. I mean, we yes. ourselves still look for coins from ancient civilizations just on Earth because yes. there's so much information there. Who was the right. leader? What year was it? What were you, what was your ability to manufacture? Uh, the images on it probably represent architecture or they represent uh, lots mm -hmm. of things. You can take a lot of information from it. Is it possible they picked those up and now they're in some cosmic uh, curio collection? You know? You're absolutely right. And I love that idea about the story is that here encapsulated, you have a bit of a story of that culture and civilization. And I also remember the dimes in Mel's hole. Yes. If they're off now, you're talking about a whole story of right. interdimensional right. travel, perhaps, or things, right. uh, you know, the, the mirror world of uh, the multiverse. And so here you wonder about these coins. Where are they now? But even if they left them, uh, this is towards the end of the book. And I, I love this aspect, too, because I believe it was uh, Ruben Uriarte who spent some time with the Shrum families who said they very generously let him stay there. And he was extremely grateful and they got along well. And he was shown all these artifacts. Now, Don Shrum had a canteen, which I also got one from my grandfather when he was in World War II. Yes. I used to go camping with it. I'd play around the yard. It's one of those World War II U.S. Army GI issue canteens it fits in a uh at this time it was kind of a lined a liner that snaps over the top you've seen them and it's got the little uh, cap on the chain yeah like a little and it's got a little curved holster kind of yes right it's right? got a kidney yeah. shaped thing so because it, it molds to your body that fit in the can and basically you could heat or eat out of it and uh, yeah. that was uh, or drink out of it and that was the cup with the handle that u-shaped handle folded around so the point here though is that he threw that at these creatures and i don't know if it at the time hit a sharp rock, but Don had to repair it. And of course, remember he's a welder. So he repaired yeah. the, the aluminum, but Ruben's holding this thing. He's like, man, this is freaking me out. This thing, because he totally believed him. He thought this, yeah. these people are genuine. Everything yeah. happened as, as he said it did. He's holding something that was touched by a creature that is not from this world. Yeah. It's like getting, a, getting your hands on a piece of moon rock or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were like, like, yeah, I don't need this piece of yeah, junk. Yeah, they just threw it down. But I understand that, and it makes it real, and I know a lot of people don't care about this, but I had another um, instance where you make that connection, and I believe I've told this story before, but we've been to museums, and you see old artifacts, and you, know, you can't touch them, but they're behind glass on display, and this was an Egyptian display, and it's like, it was all very cool. I love, uh, you know, ancient Egyptian stuff. I love the time periods. And reading the, the cards and, and getting a sense of history, but it wasn't until I got to this display where they found in a tomb and it was just the wicker furniture, the rattan furniture oh, from yeah. the royal family. Yeah. And it was cute because, of course, they had the one for the adults and they had this little tiny chair, probably about a foot high, made out of that rattan or reeds and uh, a little bit elaborate, but not ornate, not like you see in the movies. And that's all kind of cool. And... What I realized, though, is I looked down at the handles, and it was varnished. They varnished them at the time. They had a, a, a form of shellac. And the armrests had been worn down where the hands would be, 
and it had worn off the varnish, the shellac. Yeah. And I thought, this was a chair for the granddaughter of the Pharaoh, and it was her little hands that wore yeah. down those armrests. Yeah. And that made a human connection because yeah. it's like you can see a bunch of old stuff or go to an old site. And I always, of course, touch the stones like, who, who famous has touched these stones before? Right. right. And there it's like 2500 BC, her little hands did that. And now I'm looking at that. And it just makes that connection. So when he's looking at the canteen, it's like, man, some, <laughs> whatever that That's thing was. That's an intense moment. Yeah. It's a very intense moment. And, and it's different for Don Trump because uh, it was intense, but not for a good reason. Well, I got to thinking about what these things might be. And I wondered, us just having done a series recently on artificial intelligence, I got to thinking about why would you travel across the universe if you didn't have to, unless you just had vicious wanderlust, not all <laughs> who wander are lost. You want to get out there. You know, you want to do the Star Trek, strange new worlds. Of course you do. But is that really possible unless you're bending time and space? And even if you are, that might be a hard trip for a carbon-based life form mm -hmm. to make, but a machine could make it. So maybe you send drones out into space like they did in Star Wars, yep. and they sent the ones to Hoth in every direction. That's the ultimate way to figure out what destinations might be worth a real trip, right? Yeah. But think about this, though. Voyager 1 and 2 launched a long time ago. In fact, Voyager 1 was launched in 1977. Isn't that just a drone? Really? Yeah, V'ger. V'ger, right. right. So as of this writing of this outline, and there's the website's still up. This is so great. You can go see right now a ticking thing about exactly how far away it is. It is 14.7 billion miles from mm -hmm. Earth with a B. That's a long way. But consider this. Even though it was launched in 1977, and it's almost 15 billion miles away, that's one four hundredth of a light year if I did the math right, mm. a message to or from Voyager 1 right now would take 21 hours each way. And mm -hmm. again, if I'm doing the math wrong, the space nerds, feel free to let us know and we'll correct it. Mm. Now, but my point is, imagine if we had put a person on Voyager 1. They, of course, would be long dead by now <laughs> but, mm. because they would be, well, they, they, they might have made it. They'd be 45 yeah. years older. They'd be starving and probably dead from radiation or insanity. Right. Think about how hard that trip would be. But Voyager is still communicating. So maybe the aliens aren't really aliens at all in this case. Maybe they're just, like you were saying, sophisticated robots or drones. And when I say sophisticated, how sophisticated are they? Maybe not that sophisticated at all. They're clumsy. They're right. clunky. They're unable to make decisions without communication from their mothership. What if the alien race has the tech? Mm -hmm. And this only occurred to me today, but I thought this was interesting. What if they figured out interstellar travel... But only for mechanized or hybrid controllable beings, like worker bees and cybernetic, as you said, organisms that, that don't even really walk well. So it's like right. we've had this huge leap forward in bending space and time and going anywhere we want in the galaxy of the universe or not bending it and just taking right. long trips, whatever way we're doing. But we can only send our robots and we haven't quite finished developing them yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if that happened? That is a big idea, too, is that maybe even the grays that people report seeing... Yeah, might be hybrid beings that are more automaton or robotic. And certainly there's different levels right. them. people have described. Well, like with Terry's story is that the leader in charge was this six, seven foot tall mantis type being. Yeah. I'm not down with that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see a giant mantis. I'm just uh, No. No offense, uh, by the way. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, not at all. Uh, but I don't there's mean you. I mean the giant mantises that are like yes. out no, no, in my I get, yard I right I... now. Yeah. No, the idea is that uh, there's different levels of them and there's there's worker types, there are or doers, and then there's thinkers. And mm -hmm. that's also another Douglas Adams, uh, I believe, on the, uh, was the ship, the idea of the three ships that fled a dying planet and that there's three classes of them. There's the workers who actually do stuff. Yeah. And uh, then you have the thinkers, the smart beings that tell the workers what to do. And then you have all the middlemen, right. which is like advertising executives. <laughs> <laughs> people who do they they facilitate stuff but like the first us. and the third ship yeah right, they get right. blown right we're not that necessary those two ships get blown up and then what you're left with is a ship full of uh middle people right who are just kind of lost on their own i did wonder like even the beings or the controllers of the mothership are they even all that sentient or creative because they don't even have great ideas now here's their objective is to 
according to the story, collect samples of different things, observe. They were much more interested in the flora of the yeah. area. Yeah. Not so much Don. He was a consideration. He was unusual because I they, perhaps they didn't run across any other animals. As he said, they were looking at stuff, observing. They were very curious and almost puzzled about their surroundings. But that was the mission. They have other beings taking care of that, and they could spare two plus one of the clunky robots to deal with Dawn. Right. But they didn't have much of a plan. It's not like, well, just try that again. And is that controlled by something that's uh, like a computer, but not a very good one? It's like uh, run program A again. Yeah. Okay, run program B. Yeah. Try that five times. Yeah. And then nothing happens. Like, okay, well, try this now. And they get a little further, but it wasn't that successful. But again, if you ask them, it's like, that's not my job. Right. We don't deal with that stuff. We're just going to go back to the plants. But if we can get them, we'll grab them. That's a good point. Why, again, are these humanoid? Isn't it interesting that Don is a welder? And when he sees mm -hmm. the smaller, more humanoid ones, he felt like their eyes looked like welder's goggles. Yeah. And when he shot yeah. the arrow at the one, he said, quote, when I hit the chest, the sparks would fly like an arc welder, kind of. So it's again, yeah. it comes to that whole thing. He's seeing elements of what he knows in this interaction. Is that just a coincidence? Or is it just his inability to describe the indescribable? So he's leaning into his own personal experience mm -hmm. in the world to try and convey what it most closely resembled that he understood. I don't know. I don't know. Right. So right. obviously one of the big questions here is, was this all a hoax? If you were skeptic, what are you going to say? Is he making it all up? And there's a question there because he was by himself. All of this happened. He was mm -hmm. alone. The only corroboration would be the circumstantial evidence of how he appeared when he returned to camp, his story that he had, you know, torn up and set much of his clothes on fire. His arrows were gone. He had shot those, but you could do that out in the middle of nowhere. The mm -hmm. only thing that really ties it together was that Vincent Alvarez said he saw a light at the same time that this was starting to happen for Don. Right. And he signed an affidavit that said that. And so that could be the same craft. So if you're Trying to look at it as a hoax, and you obviously have to be like, oh, these details are ridiculous. This whole thing is made up. I can't even believe we're talking about this this long, because there's always somebody, no matter what the episode is, I can't believe you guys are even considering this. Well, well yes, we are. That's what we do. That's how <laughs> well, the show works. Mm -hmm. We are considering this, mm. no matter how ridiculous it is. But if that's what he's doing, why? What is the motive here? He wouldn't even attach his name mm -hmm. to this story for 43 years, because he didn't want to lose his yeah. job. He didn't want to get ostracized. He wasn't looking for fame and fortune. So what's his goal in fabricating this? And you might say, oh, well, he didn't have a goal. He was hallucinating from all the chemicals. But we looked into that. There's not hallucinations associated with mm -hmm. that exposure. And on top of that, he says, if you believe him, if you believe any of this at all, he says there's no interest in UFOs for him prior to this. So then what do you do it? Because right. in other cases, you'd be like, oh, well, you know, that UFO that supposedly hit that train, really the guy was negligent. He drove it into a downed tree and he didn't want to pay for it or get in trouble. So he lied and said a UFO came down and crashed into his train. Yes, that's a real story, by the way. Or, well, this happened. It's a cover up for something else. I'm trying to distract you from what really happened. In this right. case, the only thing that happened to him was he got lost one night, which isn't a thing to cover up. Yeah. Who cares? It's not your camper or hunter. Everybody gets lost as we just talked about right. the missing 411, but like not everybody, but. Oh uh, yeah, there's some connection to that perhaps. My question is, if it's a hoax, why is it a hoax? He didn't get rich and famous off of it. He didn't even tell anyone about it for the longest time or no one of a significant larger group. He didn't go public mm -hmm. with it, all of that. Why? Just ask yourself why, because in making it up, and this is one of the things that, that we like to point out, sometimes making up yeah. a story like this is crazier than the story being real. You know, if you're not going to buy into it, there doesn't, there's no amount of explanation or yeah, connections you can make. So that's kind of fruitless. Why do yeah. it? You look to the Travis Walton fire in the sky incident, right? Yes. And the foreman of that logging group, and I believe it was Glass who uh, was the investigator. And actually, you know, that kind of rubs me the wrong way, but I think he offered $10,000 to the youngest guy of the group to just tell me it's all a hoax because he was so, he got obsessed with trying to prove this was all fake which right. is kind of weird and, uh, yeah. and a bit unscrupulous and, uh, and unsavory on many levels. But he tried to explain it away as like, well, they were behind on their government forestry contract. So this was a risky but elaborate way to get out of that or give them some time. 
So they could meet the deadline and still cash in just saying, like, well, one of our guys got abducted. It's like, that's your plan? I mean, you know, people come up with weird kind of stuff, but regardless, that case had a more fitting goal of like, okay, well, that's more believable because that was a lot of money to them. So they got to come up with something kind of crazy that can't be proven or disproven yeah. to kind of extend that contract and get them out of it so that they can still make their money. Here, he didn't tell anybody for a long time other than there was a retired astronomy professor named Victor W. Killick, who I believe was the first outside of the, uh, Judy, the wife, who knew about this story. And of course, uh, he told his story to his two buddies, Vincent Alvarez and Tim Trueblood, who saw him. He was right there. They saw what kind of condition he was in and they believed him. And it was uh, Tim Trueblood who just decided he's never going to speak about this again. But Victor confirmed the story at least with the uh, the light in the sky and just how odd it behaved. But he saw his buddy right there and they took care of him and he was asleep in that tent recovering for the next six hours. So, and uh, they would all go back later. Well, one of the things that his wife, Judy, talks about, Judy Shrum in the book, maiden name Leg, I believe, was how he suffered horrible PTSD for years after this happened. He would wake up in the middle of the night just going, those eyes, those eyes. That is PTSD right there because it's yeah. like it's taking him back to that moment. She said that if he was out in a yard or or camping after that, which he did continue to camp some, talk about that in a second, but he would, uh, and he heard an owl, he would bristle. He would get upset mm -hmm. when he heard the owl, which was reminding him of the communications he heard. And she also added that whenever he went hunting, he was always back to his camp well before dark after that point. He was never out after dark. Yeah. She details accounts of his fear and how long it lingered after the event in Torres and Uriarte's book. She even recalls a night that they were camping with friends, including Vincent Alvarez and his wife, and Don became alarmingly quiet. He told Judy, his wife, that his ears had started buzzing, and he looked up to a ridge in the distance, and he saw some unusual lights in the sky, and he felt they were coming for him. She later found him when they went into their tent, putting a loaded handgun under his pillow. She had never seen him do that. So if this is all a hoax, he is really playing it out. He is committed to his role with his own wife, presumably years later, whenever they're outside, all mm -hmm. the details that he said from his first story, there are still those same details are affecting him in a PTSD kind of way. He would do that a lot. He would get this far away look and he'd look up and he'd, she knew that he was experiencing this buzzing in his ears, thinking that they were around. And that one time when they, they just by chance, and this is also odd, but they happened to end up living next to his good friend, the Alvarez family. Right. And one time he got that look and he had that buzzing in his ears. They all see the larger light with the smaller light following, which is pretty much what he saw. Right. Making those unusual behaviors. And so, you know, that's when I wondered... Is he somehow still connected to whatever this phenomenon or these craft are, or are they back? Are they always around? Yeah, are they always around? That's pretty much what he saw, is that it's a larger craft with a light. And again, as he first described seeing them, he thought it was a small, bright light. And he just realized, like, well, that's more than like a headlight. This thing is not so much oval. It's cigar-shaped, and it has kind of a light beam headlight on it. And the smaller craft had the typical silvery dome with the blinking light on top of that. Right. And so they all see it. So there's also some other kind of confirmation from other people too. Yeah. It's not just Don saying all of this. So I think everyone who's been around men a long time would agree. We're not real proactive about getting professional medical help to take care of a problem or preventative care or even just going in for a checkup. I know, I know, you're hoping it'll just go away or get better on its own. Or really, deep down, you just don't want to hear any bad news. Well, I know, it's a form of denial. Sadly, that is all too true, but that's why we're really glad to welcome a new sponsor that's all about taking care of some men's health issues in a modern and discreet way with Roman. Yeah, listen, almost half of men, around 42%, experience moderate to extensive hair loss in their lifetime. But this is something you can take care of effectively with Roman. Uh, yeah, I'm in that 42% and the percentage of hair I've lost is much higher. <laughs> However, <laughs> yeah, there are dear. options available to help stop balding in its tracks. And the sooner a person starts treatment for hair loss, the easier it is to keep the hair they have. 
Roman offers clinically proven medication to help treat hair loss, both prescription medication and over-the-counter treatments, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. You can also get specially formulated shampoos and conditioners with ingredients that fortify and moisturize your hair to look fuller. And there is scientific hope. Research shows that 80% of men who use prescription hair loss treatment have no further hair loss after two years. And getting started couldn't be simpler or more confidential. You just complete a free online visit. Then a U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, Roman ships it directly to you in discreet packaging with free two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Treatments start at just $20 per month on a quarterly plan. Right now, Roman has a special offer for our listeners. Use this link to get 20% off your first order. Just go to ro.co slash astonishing, all lowercase, today. That's ro.co slash astonishing for 20% off. A teen solo hiker who was terrorized for days by unknown figures dressed in white. Two cops who quit their job at a local theater because of unexplained encounters with an alleged demon. An isolated forest in Canada where people keep turning up headless. These are just some of the strange, dark, and mysterious stories you'll hear each week on the Mr. Ballin podcast. In each episode, Mr. Ballin shares real-life haunting accounts, like the case of Haley Zega, who disappeared from a hiking trail for 51 hours. When search and rescuers finally found her and asked how she survived, she simply said a friend helped her. She described this friend, four years old, black hair, brown eyes. This friend was initially dismissed until they realized a girl had gone missing in that exact spot 23 years earlier and was never found. She was four years old, had black hair and brown eyes. The bottom line is, if you like us, you'll like the Mr. Ballin podcast. Exactly. Which is why we love the Mr. Ballin podcast, because he loves all the same topics and mysterious stories like we do. In fact, some of our friends in the Legenders Lounge suggested we check out his coverage of the weirdest missing 411 cases, and, and we think he did them justice. It was super entertaining and informative. So hey, Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Mr. Ballin Podcast, Strange, Dark, and Mysterious Stories, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Joe Roddy. Now, back to the show. On page 21 of the book, listen to this excerpt about Vincent Alvarez. He was attempting to work his way back to camp that night when he suddenly noticed a bright light streaking down out of the sky from the upper atmosphere. At first, he thought it might be a slow-moving meteor. But later, after hearing Shrum's story, Alvarez became convinced that he had seen the same UFO that Shrum had encountered. That's on page 21. He later signed an affidavit that said he had seen the first appearance of the same UFO Don had seen. And he went on to say, quote, I have worked with Don for five or six years and knowing him for that length of time, I have no reason to doubt or question his integrity. So now we get to the other evidence, because like we said, he was alone when this happened. What are the other things that confirm that something happened? What are some of the outside investigations that went down? One is an interview that Forrest just alluded to a few minutes ago an Air Force interview that he did where Don and his wife actually reached out to one of her mothers, so that would be his mother-in-law's, old professors and the head of the Astronomical Observatory of Sacramento Community College. On their behalf, this gentleman, Willick, who Forrest mentioned again, on their behalf, he sent a letter to the closest Air Force base in Rancho Cordova, but a response came back from McClellan Air Force Base. Now, any UFO or UAP enthusiast will know that McClellan is part of the Air Force Logistics Command connected to Wright-Patterson Field. Their intelligence division at the time was the center for all UFO inquiries. And their main goal back then was to squash everything. So they're inadvertently, they're getting connected probably to the people who are gonna make it go away. So a couple of guys show up to talk to Don about his event. One of them, they brought a wall and sack reel-to-reel recorder, which mm. of course I immediately looked for on eBay. Very cool. <laughs> I didn't get one. I just, I have to stop buying stuff like that. I love to have a thing. It's not the actual thing, but I can, people right. can say, what's that? And I'll be like, well, this is the kind of recorder that Don Shrum's story <laughs> was recorded by the Air Force. So- Well then get yourself a Kodak uh, K100 uh, 16 millimeter camera. Oh, I, I have a lens pack for it. I oh, just don't nice, have the camera nice. I got, didn't right. work. 
work, so I returned right. it. So right, right now I have the lenses for that. No, very cool. And that's cool. the uh, Patterson Gimlin camera for those of you who don't know. Right. So just so people understand the chain of not custody so much, but the chain of inquiry, this retired astronomy professor writes a very credible letter, and he's you know he's very well respected, and say, hey, I believe this guy, you know, very much so. And I think you should check into this because at the time, and this is the big lesson too, if you have an experience like this, don't notify the military because right. they, it, nothing good's going to happen. Same thing with like the, the story of Mirage Men. Uh, supposedly though, that's now what they want. We have to ask our friend Jeremy Corbell, but I well, think now they, now they want you to notify them. Perhaps if you are a military person, but then again, it's like, uh, I can understand why nobody says anything. Right. He, he thought he had a duty for national security. It's like, yeah. I think an authority should know about this, right? This is happening. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like they already do. But here's what happened is that that letter gets written, you know, very credible letter that goes to the base commander locally. And then somehow they take it seriously enough that it gets to Wright Patterson. Yeah. So somebody was paying attention to this. Somebody took it seriously immediately and then it got attention because if this is the usual like uh, you know little green man with antennas came out of it you know it's like they get that a lot yeah. and so with the condon as you were talking about the the condon committee well their idea though is to deflect interest in this public interest because it was getting out of hand we don't know why but that was basically it's like well first of all go see what this guy's got to say and then we're going to do our thing and deal with this yeah yeah. But they want the information because, again, if you thought this guy was just a kook right from the beginning, you wouldn't even bother sending this letter on to Wright Patterson. That's right. So they sent a couple of guys. They are asking a lot of questions. Well, one of them did. This uh, gentleman Fair. referred to as Officer McLeod or later, <laughs> apparently, Officer His Cloud. Well, Captain McLeod, right. He's the officer. And then you have a non-com uh, master sergeant. Yeah, named Barnes. Bards, um, right. And this scenario reminds me a, quite a lot of Terry being interrogated exactly. in his kitchen. Terry Lovelace in Devil's Den. So it was clear these guys were trying to manipulate Don's own perception of his experience. He showed him one of the arrows he had fired at the robots. And the arrowhead was bent, had strange like little flakes on it. Don said the point was bent at 45 degrees and it looked like it had turned blue from heat, mm -hmm. from fire. And remember, he's a welder, so he knows what metal does in different circumstances. The Air Force guys took it. They took the arrow and, well, they never returned it. But mm. there is a letter from them. This is proof mm -hmm. they met with him. This is about the arrowhead. Now, we'll read that letter in a second, but here's the thing that, as you said, about the non-com, the non-commissioned officer, Barnes, he was the one that was throwing out the swamp gas stuff. He was like, well, it's probably just a bunch of Japanese. We had problems with <laughs> them just, after World War II. And it's like, just what? random Japanese? No, it was teenagers, mischievous teenagers out right. in the woods. They were pranking you. What are you talking about? That's And those are the stuff they're starting to feeding this stuff, yeah. playing with his mind. So that arrowhead that never got returned, this is interesting. Here's a letter from uh, September 9th, 1968. This was written to uh, Ted Bloker, who had worked with Paul Cerny, who was the NICAP right. investigator who did this right. report. This replies to your letter of August 28th, 1968, in which you requested information concerning a sighting by Donald Trump on the night of September 11th, 12th, 1964, in the vicinity of Cisco Grove, California. According to Air Force records, Mr. Shrum experienced his sighting the night of September 5th, 1964, not September 11th and 12th. He reported his sighting to an astronomical observatory. The observatory reported the incident to Mather Air Force Base in a letter dated September 9th, 1964. A formal investigation was conducted by McClellan Air Force Base on September 25th, 1964. Mr. Schramm provided the Air Force with an arrow tip, but not with a complete arrow. The tip was not subjected to any laboratory analysis. It has been loaned to the University of Colorado UFO Study Group and as yet has not been returned to Mr. Schramm. The Air Force evaluation of Mr. Shrum's sighting is carried in the other category. It's in all caps. <laughs> mm -hmm. James H. Aikman, Major, U.S. Air Force, Chief Civil Branch, Community Relations Division, Office of Information. And there's a lie right there. He's saying they gave him the whole arrow. He's saying we didn't get that whole arrow. We just got an arrow mm -hmm. head and right. we disappeared it. We gave it to this mysterious group at the University of Colorado. They don't know where it is. He never got it back. But yeah. what this shows... Right here on this Department of the Air Force letterhead, dated 1968, this official letter from a real person is that they acknowledge that they talked to him about this incident 
And they acknowledge, even whether it was just the arrowhead or the arrow, that they took something from him that they did not return. And we all know, Mm -hmm. you listeners know, you've been with us a while, what that means when they take the thing and they don't give it back. Mm. It doesn't mean that nothing was going on most of the time. Right, right. Bet sphere, anyone. Yeah. Well, they're going to break it too or damage it. You're not going to get that stuff back. That uh, <laughs> that happens a lot, even I think with private you know, endeavors where you give it to a lab. and they That happens some other time, I think, with... Uh, I have something to say about it. Regarding yeah. the thing you were saying earlier about the... When we were talking about machetes, or we were talking about a, right. a research mission that didn't work out. One of the things that might have had to happen on it would have been the recovery of genetic material. Yeah. And I was supposed to be on this trip and the project leader had asked me to take steps to be prepared to do that. I can't even begin to tell you the amount of panic that ensues when you think, (laughs) right, I only barely know what I'm doing anyway. I'm quite possibly going to be out in the middle of nowhere. And if we find something that needs to be recovered and tested in a lab, yeah. So I'm on Amazon. I'm like, genetic recovery kit. You know, it's like, here, get these Ziplocs and a test tube. It's like, you have no idea what you're doing. And so it, right. it starts to give you this perspective of like, oh, when we come into it later, it's just like, how did that other person's hair get into this thing? It's like, right. it's hard to learn all those protocols. And that's another thing that happens in this story, which you'll hear about one of the other arrowheads in a minute. It's like, you're just trying to get to the bottom of stuff. You haven't been trained in forensic analysis. It's difficult and it's very expensive and tricky to get the person who does know how to do that stuff to go somewhere with you or be a part of the process. Mm -hmm. So you're immediately when you're trying to investigate something like this scientifically and you're that's not your milieu going into it, you're going to make mistakes. Things are going to get lost. Things aren't going to get returned. I mean, it's different with the military, I think. But like but that's true, too. The military is a mess. I have a friend in a certain department that I probably shouldn't even say, but he has told me over and over, (laughs) it's a mess. It's a wonder anything gets from one desk to another one. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of that too. So you can't read into everything, but just some observations about that. Well, two to three weeks after they uh, had that meeting, they go back to the site. Don goes back with his brother, Bill, Vincent Mm -hmm. Alvarez, and another friend named Bill, Bill Adams. And they realized once they got there that the site had been completely combed everything was gone yeah there were cigarette butts which is uh, kind of hilarious is that they they combed literally they raked it with rakes he could still yeah. see the rake marks they literally raked everything every inch of dirt for any bit of evidence because they were still burned uh, a lot of the stuff that he'd burned and thrown down his hunting license or whatever uh you know was still there pieces of burnt clothing And they scooped all that up, but they left their own trash. Right. This is, of course, the picture that we're doing. This is straight from the movies, of course, is that there's some cigar chomping uh, captain or major. He's like, he's got the, you know, he's got the cigar. Like, oh, you fellas, hurry this up. I want to get home in time for dinner. You know, and he's like, (laughs) throws the cigar butt down. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, come on. This is a nice place. Like, stop littering. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, back then they got what they wanted and, uh, but they're, they're leaving their own trash. There were cigarette packs of different brands. So obviously a bunch of different people. A bunch of people been there. Yeah. Again, that reminds me of Mel's Hole, uh, yellow equipment coming in and clearing out the area. But here they wanted to scoop up every little piece of evidence because, uh, there's a collection out there and you get a lot of, uh, experts now saying that they believe Luell is onto one of them that we are in possession of off-world materials but it's been picked clean and so and he, again there were footprints and Don described when he climbed down he saw footprints but he described them as being smooth and very small like yeah. a child not a real small child but let's say a juvenile wearing a moccasin they were kind That's of smooth right. no tread and there was footprints all around the tree of where these things were those of course are gone now yeah they raked them. Yeah. Well, here's what, uh, and I'm sure they took photos, I would hope so. Here's what Don and his companions believe now is that something happened here. Right. They didn't witness all this, but they could see that uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Why would you come here with a, a large group? And certainly this wasn't uh, just the park service cleaning the place up. And this is what I believe they were really after. They didn't really care so much about Don's story. I mean, they want the details and recorded it, but they really wanted the location. Yeah. They wanted to know where exactly he was because there might be some things left behind they could find useful. Reverse engineering. Right. And you know what? They overlooked one of his arrows, which he found down in a bush. But he right. said that it's it's not surprising. It was camouflage. You'd have to know what you're looking for. It right. looked like a branch. But he did find the third arrow in the bush. 
what I would have liked to do is head out there with a tracker like Bob Gimlin and go find <laughs> where the other ones trudged through the yeah, hedges and see yeah. if the hedges were damaged or the branches were broken. If you right. could track some kind of trail through there, and maybe they did that, but right. you know, I don't know. Here's a part of the description I love. This was told by Dan Trum, Don's son. They didn't find it because they weren't there during the experience, but he was, and he knew where to find it. And because he's an experienced bow hunter, he knew that when he, he hit this robot, the second mechanical one, because again, he, he didn't think that the other ones were really causing that much harm. He, they didn't deserve to die or get harmed. That's right. He didn't take any shots at them. Yeah, there's an element too there that you even under duress, it's like, I, I can't do that. So he takes a shot at the more robotic one who said, well, that's the one that's causing me the problems. And if it keeps up, you know, I could fall out of this tree. It could really harm me. And plus I won't have to stop. And also it looks more robotic. So he takes a shot, this arrow hits it. And he said this bright shower emits shower of sparks. And this weird reaction happens, like it was electromagnetically charged and somehow the arrow being metal reacted to this. It has a, a very strange reaction, so at least it's not no effect, but it, it reels this thing back a few feet. It's like, whoa, you know, just like recalculating, you know, <laughs> or the Terminator, yeah. like it's going through like yeah. alternate power supply. And it's yeah. trying to reformulate itself, but he knew that that arrow skipped off him at a 45 degree angle. So he knew what bush to look for that arrow. And that's how he found it because he, he was there. He knew what bush it would likely be in. And it was discovered by all these other folks. Now you could say like, well, there you go. He just planted it. So these other fellows would believe it. But like, here's a case that no one's writing a book until now, but it wasn't even him. No one wants this out. None of these guys, they're all afraid they're going to lose their jobs. Yeah. And you know, there was an incident two years later that they don't think was connected, but you know, it doesn't behoove anybody this comes out. Don wants this to go away, but he also wants to see what happened. So we should talk a little bit about Paul Cerny, who has passed away. He was a NICAP investigator who worked on this case, and his investigation allowed Torres and Uriarte to write their book. They got a lot of work from him, so that was how they were able to make it even more thorough. And Don had sent another arrowhead to NICAP via Mr. Cerny, but unfortunately, this one wasn't packed very well. And this is what I was talking about, recovering genetic material or preparing something for forensic analysis. Most people don't know how to do it. So by the time this got to the lab it went to, it didn't have any trace evidence on it anymore. So they weren't able to recover. And there's a letter about that too. So mm -hmm. in, you know, in terms of the hoax thing, why are they mailing these arrowheads everywhere if they know it's all fake, especially to labs? Mm. So. I guess it's all part of the hoax, right? But, well, somebody's crazy or making making money somewhere. Yeah, you know, yeah, making money, making yeah. right. So, <laughs> supposedly one of Don's arrowheads actually made it to uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek's personal yeah. collection somehow, and when he died, it was donated to the University of Arizona, apparently. So I'm wondering if that's sitting in some shelf in a basement there. Well, here's a, a little point that Colorado study group with the university. Yeah, the yeah. Colorado group was the committee of the scientific investigation of unidentified flying objects objects led by Edward U. Condon, which conducted oh, right. its study from November 1966 to November 1968. Not getting that one back. And informally <laughs> known as the Condon Committee, okay, and the Condon Report, and their mission was to like, I think this guy's a little off. End yeah. of story. Yeah. Nothing to see here. Anyway, so uh, that's from the book, but that's where that thing was loaned to, and I would have loved to have seen Dr. Hynek's collection of hotchkeys apparently he had a a, a replica or yes, something or another indeed. bet sphere type ball that was reported by i think his son yeah where did all that stuff go so that goes to a university and again somewhere in a shoebox is the first generation print of the patterson gimblin film well let's talk about just briefly one thing we looked into that raised more questions than answers and that was the moon that night it was very interesting because the moon actually set on September 4th, 1964. And this is based on historical data from the Sacramento area at about 7.30 PM that night. Up in the mountains, it might've set a little bit earlier, but that's when it went down below the horizon. It was over 40 degrees below the horizon at its lowest point and below the horizon all night long. NICAP actually uncovered this fact too, uh, Cerny did. Now, Don said, when the mothership came around, he saw it in the moonlight. 
And he makes reference to the moon coming up about two hours after everything started. So around maybe 10 p.m. or so or something like that. But with the moon below the horizon also went on top of that, it was a new moon, which means even if it had been up, it would have just been a sliver. So that is a detail that's, uh, it, it begs some questions. Like maybe he was just confused about the source of light that was illuminating the mothership that he saw, or does it mean the whole story is a lie? I don't know. For me, it doesn't seem that it does, but we wanted to point it out. We, you know, we always kind of look at that. We try to look at the details from the story. It's like, well, let's see. When did the sun rise and set? What was the weather like that night? Where was the moon? That sort of thing, which I'm sure that NICAP and MUFON, they all try to do that stuff. But it's basic investigation. But I do wonder, could there have been another light source? Or could it have been some kind of influence on his perception? Because this whole night could have mm -hmm. been that. So just something to think about there. We did find the approximate location where this mm. happened in Google Earth. It's too complicated to explain here, but there's some key takeaways. When you go down to the area where the tree most likely is or was, and you're looking at it in a topographical 3D view on Google Earth or Google Earth Pro, which is what I use on a, on a Mac here, you can see that their campsite is indeed behind a ridge from the point at which Don probably was in the tree. It's about one and a half miles, 1.65 miles from where this all happened. But the area is, mm -hmm. it's just as Don described it when you look at it. And you can see why getting back to the campsite from where the tree was after dark would have been dangerous. Well, we do want to talk about some parallels to other cases that were similar. Some that we've covered in Astonishing Legends, and there were a couple that were mentioned in Aliens in the Forest that bear mentioning here. One was the Brooksville incident. Uh, this is another incident that happened less than a year later in Florida, where a man named John Reeves claimed to have encountered a robot working around a UFO that landed, uh, which he interacted with. This robot was different in appearance, though. Uh, listen to this excerpt. This is from a blog called donkeyjunk.com. We'll, ha we'll have a link to it. But th oh, this was a good telling of that whole story, which has a lot of detail. We're not going to share the whole thing here, but here's an excerpt that I thought was interesting. Early in the afternoon, Reeves had been wandering in the shrublands when he spotted a big flying saucer, in quotes, sitting in an open clearing on the top of a sandhill, reddish purple and bluish green in color. It rested on four legs and was six feet high and 20 to 30 feet in diameter. Reeves sneaked up to within a hundred feet of the craft, then crawled into dense bushes to watch it further. Suddenly he saw something moving on the far side of the object and headed in his direction. A robot with a glass dome or a space helmet over its head spotted Reeves and came within 15 feet of him. Though Reeves would persist in calling the figure a robot, reasoning that, quote, anything that isn't human has got to be a robot, end quote. Hmm. He described an essentially human-like body with a darkly tanned face, five feet tall, clad in a silver-gray canvas material. It had thin white gloves on its hands and metallic-looking boots on its feet. Its eyes were a little farther apart, closer to the ears, and its chin a bit more pointed up than a normal person's. And it had a cylinder on its back and was wearing a skull cap. After watching him for a minute and a half, it reached to its left side and produced a round black object, six or seven inches in diameter. It lifted the device to its chin, and the device flashed twice. Reeves tried to run, but he tripped and fell back down into a sitting position facing the figure, which flashed the round object at him one more time. Reeves thought it was taking his picture. You should follow that link in our show notes. That is an interesting mm. story. There's more to it, including him saying that he was taken to another planet, like Orfeo. It also reminds me a little of the Solway Firth Spaceman. Sighting oh yeah, picture. it does. That's a, yeah, just that, that, that sighting. And you know, here's a general comment. It's like, if there are higher extraterrestrial intelligences out there in physical space or another dimension or plane, wouldn't it make sense that their technology also develops, that their spacesuits from 1965 aren't going to be the same ones as from 2005. Right. Would they yeah. be developing at a much faster rate or at their own pace? Uh, who knows? But it's interesting that... Uh, I just read the other day, maybe two days ago, that the spacesuits that they're developing for the next moon mission, because mm -hmm. you know we're trying to send people back there, mm. will cost one billion dollars. <laughs> one billion dollars. One billion dollars. Anyway. Wow. But just look at the ones that, uh, you know, from the, the 60s space programs, which were a technological marvel, okay, because they have to keep you from 
death, freezing please. to death and roasting to death, which people don't realize. That's what they said about these. I right. just can't stop thinking how Elon Musk, instead of buying Twitter, he could have bought 44 spacesuits. But uh, <laughs> Well, know. what are you going to do with all those? Uh, you know, he can send 44 people to the moon or right. maybe Mars. I guess they have to have different requirements. So. Talking about that, that was my point. Look at the spacesuits that have uh, that are recently employed. Yeah. And how different they look. Not a whole lot. Of course, they have to be bipedal, uh, arms, legs, uh, head, torso, all that stuff. But those suits that they were using, if you're talking about the really modern ones that look like 2001 that right. I think SpaceX was using, there's no EVAs in those. No, 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 That's no. That's a different I, thing. I, I know. They're in-craft uh, suits. Yeah, but yeah. what I'm saying yeah. is that they look different than the ones they that were on the cool. Apollo missions. And so how long has that been, you know, that yeah. we've had to develop that, you know, 55 years or so. And then it's taken us this long. But what is the tech of other civilizations? And I think it's so vast and so varied there's no way to track that really or get a, a handle on that. But you can make observations, which is why this story is also great. There is a sketch from this story that we just read, which to me seems different enough to be different from what Don Trump saw. Mm -hmm. Not that that's comforting. So it's, it's so great. Now it seems like Earth is a party destination for all <laughs> kinds of things from lots of different places. Oh, boy. We have to mention the Mad Gasser, who we haven't done a show specifically mm -hmm. on, but we've mentioned him before, the Mad Gasser of Mattoon, Illinois. This was in the 1940s. Do you remember where we mentioned it? Uh, um, Tessa's has done, a, a, of course, a blog entry on this. You yes, should all she go has. Check she's that done out. a blog yeah. entry on everything. It's amazing. I know. She's done. She uh, has speaking done, of which, uh, visit everything. our blog at astonishinglegends.com because Tess does, uh, has covered everything. There's there. hundreds of, uh, yeah, really terrific entries in there. But in this case, yes. you do you remember where we talked about this? Because it that case fits into another paradigm. I uh, know. I can't remember which episode it was. I could certainly... It was the sociological aspects of the Mad Gasser of Mattoon when people erroneously say something was... Mass hysteria. Mass hysteria, exactly. Yes, I do know that it, mass hysteria is associated with that case. But right. the thing about that case, it feels a little more human, mm -hmm. like it was a weird person, frankly. Also, Spring Hill Jack, if you remember, I think there yeah. were some accounts where he shot some kind of weird gas, of course, that made uh, the, the ladies faint back then. But I think right. seeing anything like that would make anyone faint back then. But, but also, yeah. people described uh, sparks coming out from a device on his chest, I believe. That's right. That's right. Sparks, yeah. gas. You're seeing a pattern here? I am absolutely seeing a pattern. We additionally must mention Terry Lovelace, which we've already brought up a few times, but there's a lot of common ground mm -hmm. between Terry's story and Donald Trump's story. And I'm ha finding myself wondering if Terry knows this story. We mm. should tell him about it. He might yeah. not because it's, it's one of the more obscure ones. But the other interesting thing is Terry worked on a missile base at the yeah. time of his story. Here's something else, and it's not even, I actually hadn't even written it into our outline, but I'm remembering it right now. You know, one of the things that we had worked on with, again, with Google Earth, when Terry came on about the incident Devil's Den, which was, you just have to hear it. I'm sorry, I can't explain it, but mm. we found an area where he thought it took place. It was a plateau at the top of a peak that had a strange clearing in it. And guess what, Terry, if you ever do listen to this? There's a place called Cherry Point that is very close proximity to what happened to Donald Trump. And mm -hmm. it looks the same as the plateau in the Devil's Den incident. And Terry worked at a missile base. Donald yeah. Trump built missiles, some of the most potent ones at the time, and was working on rocket programs. So Right. There's also a rather grim name to the area Donald Trump was in, which I, I think it's also called Desolation Valley. Yeah, there was an, a section there called Desolation Valley. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's a lot of that stuff. And, and the missile that Shrum worked on the most of the time was the submarine launched Polaris nuclear missile, which could be launched from underwater. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a high potency, serious piece of destructive weapon, much like the missiles that were at the base that Terry worked at. And mm -hmm. Terry went camping with friends. They got kind of lost and disoriented. And then they were taken aboard a silent craft. There, there are some differences. The beings communicated with Terry differently, and there were other people present in Terry's experience. If you want to hear that, just go look up uh, the incident at Devil's Den. And then Terry came back, actually, for another one called Devil's Den, The Reckoning, which was a two-part series, which I'm going to mention here in a minute. But first, we cannot cover this whole thing without mentioning Sam the Sandown Clown, one mm. of my personal favorites, mm -hmm. episode 183 from July of 2020. 
That happened nine years after Don Trump's experience in England in May of 1973 on the Isle of Wight. And this was a robot. Again, a goofy looking clown looking well, robot. Was it? Was, it? <laughs> it was physically <laughs> clumsy. Yeah, that's true. It was a clumsy communicator. It had this shed that might have been some kind of ship. My question yeah. is, was its appearance or his appearance dictated by the children that saw him because it was children that saw him. Right. Don saw welder's goggles and arc welder lights. The sound down children saw a robot clown. Now remember this again, Devil's Den the Reckoning part two, Terry shared a story that had been sent to him by a woman named Julia, who along with her sister, Molly vanished off the family farm for a short time after seeing a strange floating carousel yeah. over a berm behind their house. Yeah. Terry himself saw little talking circus monkeys in his house when he was a kid. So this is my question. Are we all, are all these people just seeing something that is partially formed by what is in their minds or what something thinks their mind will be able to understand right. and not be threatened by? You think about this environment for Don. He's a welder. He works in metals. The things that are happening, maybe that that was supposed to be, hey, he'll get this. He'll understand mm -hmm. this. It's like Indrid Cold coming down in the lantern and he gets out and it sounds like the door on a 57 Chevy. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? So again, we brought this up before. We're bringing it up again because it is a recurring theme in all these stories told by people who don't know each other and don't even know each other's stories. So it's either the same kind of hallucination and some problem that all of these people are having that's undiagnosed by the medical community or something common is happening between complete strangers that don't know each other. There's a common, and that's what Force and I always talk about. One of the things we learned from doing this show is we're covering all this stuff. We are starting to see these webs that tie things together that are in, invisible to the individuals. But when you get up to the high view of the big picture, you start to see a lot of common ground. I think it would behoove all of us who are interested in this kind of fair to loosen your concrete and ultimately confident belief in what you think reality is composed of. I think in actuality, it's a lot more plastic and fluid than we dare to imagine, except for those scientists and experts and researchers that are actually looking into consciousness studies. It's stuff that will literally perhaps blow your mind. But I think it's a lot less firm, and that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. It's also philosophical. It's like Mothman. What do you mean I'm not going to understand what this thing's, creature's, phenomenon's reasoning is? I should be able to understand all reasoning, right? It's like, no, you're not that thing. It doesn't think like you. And that's not to say that it just doesn't have the same desires and goals as you or motivations or it wants to collect the manzanita for different purposes. It just doesn't think the same way you do in that it's the difference between a Mac computer and a PC. They have different operating systems. They achieve the same goals, but they don't think the same way to get to the same end. I learned this in a basic computing class in high school in that you have uh, different languages, right? We had basic and that's what we learned because uh, you could take words and words could be fitted into commands. But I was always intrigued by this other programming language called machine language, which was long strings of numbers, but that's abstract to us. That's not our natural thing. Words are and descriptions, S string, dollar sign, end, go, P list, all these things are, are the commands that we can understand because they're, they're based on words. When you have long strings of numbers, that's abstract to us. We don't think like that. But if you could memorize that as a programmer, I always remember them saying like, oh, well, machine language, machine programming runs a lot faster. It's a lot more efficient than basic because you're telling a machine what to do and what better language than the language it speaks. It's just get to the point. I don't want to hear about your S strings and your P lists. Just give me the numbers to do what I need to do because we have the same objective or something slightly different. But in this case, the objective seems the same, which is study the natural area habitat, collect what you can, but we're not here on a, on a peacemaking mission. See if you can nab that pyromaniac uh, ape in the tree, but if you can't forget it, we, we got other stuff to do. It just wasn't part of the program here. And yeah, it seems silly that they don't seem more efficient, but we don't know what they were up to other than it seemed like they, as he said, very interested 
in the surroundings and interested in collecting some samples. Aside from that, it's like, you know, I can't blame them <laughs> or mock them. It's like, well, you fellows really made a mess of that because uh, that seems pretty clumsy. It's just like, <laughs> I always think of Christopher Lloyd's character in Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> that was it, that, that other great character actor comes into their lab, right? From these, these aliens who look like humans. And it's like, uh, man, this place is a mess. Don't you people have any pride in your work? And he grabs him and before he knocks him out, says, it's not my GD planet, monkey boy. It's like, <laughs> hey, don't, don't be criticizing me for a messy lab. You don't know how we work, okay? So you stick to your own stupid stuff. You're right. not anywhere near the technology we have. And if we want to be messy and work like that, that's our business. And because we're on the, the theme of movies and TV, it did remind me his ordeal here uh, and a, perhaps equally frightening for different reasons, the ordeal in the tree. I'm not sure if you've seen this, uh, but I know a lot of folks have. It's not a series for everyone because it gets kind of dark, but the series Black Mirror, it's been out three or four years now, perhaps. And there is a scene where there are these Boston Dynamic type hunter killer dog type robots, right? And they're very fast and very efficient. They are designed to hunt people down in the most quickest and most efficient and brutal means. And one of the humans that's still around has managed to scramble up a tree. And this thing can't climb trees, but it can sit there. And of course, it's a machine. It has infinite patience. Not to spoil anything because this thing's been out quite a while, but basically, it, you know, she can't get down. So how is she going to get around this thing? Because she can't stay in the tree forever. So what she has, though, is that uh, she notices that however she moves... Whatever she has, she's got a bag of like those starlight mint candies, right? Because that's kind of her thing. She loves those mint candies. And she throws one down. And of course, that gets the robot dog to react. It stands up, it charges up, it scouts the area. And she realizes that that's going to take a little bit of energy. And I love the thinking on it because it's like Donald Trump realizing like that one robot really didn't like fire. Like it just like, I don't mean no like fire. And it's just scraping the embers off the, the third yeah. rock. Yeah. It doesn't seem to like that around, like the, the glowing embers, even though the fire is out. Maybe they're afraid of fire and embers, and maybe I can use that to my advantage. And one thing before you and I started reading, you were a little ahead of me, but you said he was very good tactically. Like he used his head, he kept his wits yep. about him, and yep. he was uh, he, he was thinking, like putting the belt around. It's like, well, if they knock me out, I'm going to follow this tree and I'm going to die. On the other side of this tree is a deep canyon. Yeah. And sadly, he thought like, well, maybe, you know, if this keeps up, maybe I just jump. But the thought of his young daughter and wife still there kept him going. In this Black Mirror episode called Metalhead, she realizes that maybe she can use this to her advantage because that's all she's got. She's got no gun or anything. So she starts throwing mints down and she realizes this thing has to come to life, come off power saver mode and react to this. And she keeps doing it. And eventually she drains its battery. Right. And she can get out of the tree. Anyway, I just, I love the thinking that, uh, in that scenario. And of course that's fiction. This one, perhaps a lot of people are going to say it's fiction, but I don't know. It's just weird enough to be true. So speaking of being too weird to be true or too true to be faked, or you decide the logic on that, Scott, what are your final thoughts on this? How do you file this in your file cabinet of reason? I ha was having an almost split personality reaction to reading this because I remember thinking, I remember smirking a little bit, but just like, this is ridiculous. Look at what's <laughs> happening here. Yeah. And then I remember conversely also thinking this would be terrifying. Yes. Okay. So imagine how relentless this would feel being treed by something from another world, something that clearly has incredibly advanced technology, right? Or it wouldn't even be there, but at the same time, it seems to have an inordinate amount of tunnel vision regarding its goals. These beings wanted to get to Shrum, but not at first. At first, they tried to collect samples, apparently. Then uh, once they were told to get Don, they focused on that, or the robot enforcers did anyway. The question is why? Why did this happen to Donald Trump? Was he mm. just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Would this event have just happened? What was he to these things? Just another animal in the woods, or was he an employee of a nearby missile facility 
Why couldn't they reason how to deal with them? And also, hadn't they heard of the Prime Directive? Apparently not. <laughs> well, they but, don't. So my question is, yeah. <laughs> what could possibly care? be the goal here? Right. What could be the goal here? Did Trump make it all up and then spend years faking PTSD, keeping his name and story quiet, puzzling over it for decades? It feels like he believes the story. Mm -hmm. But if it's true, what does it mean? And how are these crafts and beings getting here? Are they traversing great distances or somehow taking a shortcut from another space and time? Well, whatever happened to Donald Trump, we're lucky his story got told, and we have Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte to thank for getting his account on record. Some folks probably think the details of the story are so absurd there's no way it can be confirmed, but as we've seen, absurdist details seem to be part and parcel of many paranormal stories. And skeptics might say, well, that's because they're all made up. Why would they say that? Maybe because they believe it, they're all made up. Perhaps because a world in which these things happen is wildly disconcerting, so it's easier to dismiss it as false. Now, we're not saying this story is true, but our analysis of it would suggest that Donald Trump and his family believe the story and believe him. So let's say we believe him too. Where does that leave us? On our last junk drawer on Patreon, we had our good friend Rob Christopherson on, along with his friend Todd Purse. And one of the things that Rob brought up was something that we talked about on Astonishing Legends before too. It's getting past whether or not something happened and focusing on why it happened. So the more and more we look into these astonishing legends, the more and more it seems like we all need to reevaluate the tools we use to analyze them. And this is something Forrest alluded to earlier about our sense of reality. Our approach is all wrong somehow. We have to do more than get past whether or not these stories are true. We might need to change our assumptions about what the details mean. Because the more we look at them, the more questions we have. There is something going on that would appear to be so far outside of our reality that we don't even know how to begin to study it. It all feels like bad theater. Like w what is actually happening is a red herring. And the perception of it all is dictated by the mind of the person experiencing it. Because if it was what it looked like, a bunch of not very bright organic lab technicians <laughs> gathering leaves and then some clumsy, also not so smart robots trying to get a person out of a tree, then what is that? How can you manage interstellar travel but be too stupid to get a human being out of a tree? It's almost comically mundane. But again, we've seen that same rapper on many other stories we've heard. Terry Lovelace speculated that it might be to make it harder to believe when the story is retold. We too have imagined that the familiarity, the things that are familiar to you about something that you're experiencing, is a filter that's supposed to make you feel more comfortable, but they're clumsy at it. And it just winds up feeling like the uncanny valley concept that robotics professor Masahiro Mori created in 1970. And the, the idea behind that is that robots that are so close to a human being that if they have even a little bit of something that's off, it becomes wildly disconcerting. These ridiculous beings and robots are just like the wind-up toy robot from the 1950s that you'd put on the floor and, and by the way, this is before my time. I'm not saying I had one oh, of those, but well, they, they would go around <laughs> until they bumped into something and then just keep bumping into it. That's not very scary, is it? But when the robot is as big as you are and emitting a gas that knocks you out and then also staying engaged with you for 12 hours, how do you cope? It's silly and scary at the same time. It's like the Terminator near the end of the movie. Simultaneously, not very threatening anymore in a way, but nevertheless, relentless. That's gonna wrap up the battle at Cisco Grove. Join our Patreon to hear us on the much more candid Astonishing Junk Drawer, which most of the time we do live on video for our patrons. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Paul. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hill. P. Hi, I'm Joseph Roddy. A. You spell my name? H-I-L-L. -L. U. R-A-D-I. L. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Carestia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at deadstreetproductions.com. 
Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night.